day of the International Women's Sports Summit. The amount of brilliance and courage that has been in this room over the last two days and that we'll hear from again today has been incredible. And I hope every single one of you has felt uplifted and empowered and encouraged that there are people willing to take brave stances to back women and girls and their future around the world. Um, no matter what you hear in the news, because this will be documented in the news, we will be sharing and publishing all of the speeches. The goal of this summit has been to bring people together to raise awareness for the injustices that are being perpetrated against women and girls around the world. And we are focused on lifting up their voices, having their backs, and ensuring that there is a fair and just world for them to be a part of. So um, please, a round of applause for everyone that has contributed to the, making this happen. <laughs> Thank you for being here. Thank you for your participation. And I hope that today uh, feels, I know yesterday was long. <laughs> and stick with us. This is a shorter day. There are people um, needing to catch planes at all different sides. We hope that today is more conversational. Um, and we will wrap up with actions, plans, what we can do, what we have to look forward to, and of course, just a whole bunch of amazing messages from amazing speakers. So here today, we will start off by hearing from Jade Dickens, who's going to introduce our first session. Welcome, Jade. And I did, should mention her amazing accomplishments. World record holder and eight-time world champion. <laughs> loud enough to be able to speak to everybody, but. <laughs> do you want to just hold it? Or sure, whichever one you want me to do. All right, thank you. Um, thank you very much for having me here. This has been a very long fight and journey. I am Jade Dickens. I am a 20 plus year competitive strength athlete. I still compete to this day. I actually have two strongman competitions coming up in about two weeks. So. <laughs> Yeah, it's, <laughs> yes ma'am, yes ma'am. I have been an active member of the USA Powerlifting Team for over 22 years. That is what brought me into this. As y'all know what happened in Minnesota, we have been fighting that now since 2018. USAPL has really set the standard for female sports and I'm here to support them in every way, shape, form I can to help out. I found the love of sports later in life. I was about 28, and responsibility came pretty early for me. Um, I had my first child at 16. So by the age of 19, I had to take care of her and I, obviously. So I went to work in our local prison system at a predominantly male. I did 10 and a half years working in a male security, maximum security penitentiary. So during that time, some of my coworkers and I decided to participate in a bench press competition for Special Olympics as a fundraiser. So I was one of the like six women on the unit. I was a supervisor, I was a night shift supervisor at the time, and we had a couple of officers and I would, when we took our breaks, we would of course, we'd go to the weight room. And there, we had the competition. I won on the female side. <laughs> Very first taste of success when it came to sports. I was, I was all in. It has been my life now for 20 plus years. I'm a meat promoter. I am a coach. I taught in public school and coach powerlifting in public school. I had I, just the essence of sports for me is what 
is, is a humongous part of who I am. So the camaraderie and the support that I got from those men while we were battling a maximum security penitentiary at the time, and also having the ability to be strong, it helped not just on the platform, but it helped in real life as well. Being strong physically allows you to have confidence in yourself and allows you to be strong emotionally, mentally, and then that comes out. It comes out in a different way. It helps you also be able to reach out to other women and be able to bring them up and be able to say, come with me. Come on, let me show you. Let me get you in here with me. And that has been one of the things that I have been able to do with the strength sports for so many years now. Powerlifting has allowed me to travel the world. I am an international competitor. And I've been to 10 different countries. I've been almost to all of the states in the United States, all because of powerlifting. And it is, I get to introduce the international panel today. I felt that was a little, it was, I was giddy. I was giddy at the fact that I got to do that. So, you know, with, four, with competitive sports gives us all the encouragement to find the strength in our bodies and let us see that we are valuable and capable. As I walked the junior high hallways as a teacher and a coach, those girls out there don't know their value. We know that because we were those girls. So I would actually go out and recruit the girls that I knew wanted. I would recruit cheerleaders and gymna gymnasts. I would recruit the kids that were sitting on the bench, whether they were on the A team or the B team. And I would recruit, because I'm from a country town, the 4-H kids. I knew all those kids were going to be strong. And in that, built a 2009 state championship team and a 2013 national championship team. So. <laughs> the effect of powerlifting on young women, as I've been saying, it's really hard to overstate. If you ever feel down about yourself, if you ever feel that you need an extra boost of confidence, get in the weight room. Get in the weight room, put your headphones on, ignore the looks, ignore those men, YouTube what you need, build your confidence, because that's where you're going to find it. And the recent state of Minnesota ruling affects me directly and should concern everybody about sports. Minnesota has opted to deprive both men and women of any opportunities in powerlifting by insisting, unless a national governing body discriminates against women, by allowing the male athletes to compete head to head against women, sports must be removed for everyone. That's what Minnesota did. Minnesota took it away, USA powerlifting away from everybody. The ruling of the judge in Minnesota affects us all, all women, all sports. Rulings like these threaten national positions for sports and everything that competitive sports brings to our communities, our states and our country. We need brave men, and I've said this from the beginning, we need the men to step up and speak out for us. We also need our fellow ladies to step up and speak and defend the integrity and the equal opportunity for girls and women. I have worked way too hard. Everybody has, everybody in this room, we have worked way too hard to be dismissed and exiled from our sports just because we were born female. I'm honored to get to introduce the international panel. Like I said, I've been able to travel internationally with, with my competitions. First, and I've gotten to know this lady over the past couple of days, I'd like to introduce Fiona, and I'm probably not going to do a very good job on your last name, McEnany. Good enough? Okay, thank you. <laughs> From Fair Play for Women. True, come on. 
Fiona has worked for Fair Play for Women since 2019 and leads their sports campaign. Thank you, Jake. Yes, ma'am. They've met with dozens of UK and international sports federation and pushed them to center women in their female category. I've actually, uh, Fiona doesn't know this, but I have actually watched what they have done and I took it back to our legislation in Texas to let them know what was taking place across the pond. So, I've been watching. <laughs> our next person is Ro Edge. Come on up. She is here all the way from New Zealand. Uh, she doesn't know this either, but I've been watching her as well. <laughs> New Zealand was on the forefront of it, as we know. A founder of both Save Women's Sports Australia's and the International Consortium of Female Sports, she has been a pivotal force in both New Zealand and Australia, drawing public attention to how government agencies and sports organizations are undermining the integrity, safety, and opportunities provided by single-set sports for women and girls. Our next person is Nelly Becerra, joins us from Mexico. Yes, ma'am, thank you. She is a triathlete for more than 30 years and a former national record holder, and she has received awards and recognitions at national and international level for supporting and promoting women's sports. Nellie is a member of the Mexican Triathlon Federation Executive Board Committee. Whew, that was a mouthful. Formerly a Secretary General and currently a Treasurer. She is also a former member of the International Triathlon Union Women's Committee. Thank you for being here with us. Now, I've really gotten to know Linda the past, what, 36 hours, and I'm really excited about that. And so Canada's Linda Blade is here as well. Come on up, come on up. She has played almost every role possible in sports. Athlete, national champion in two countries, coach, PhD scholar, international sports educator, children athletics program developer, professional sport performance consultant, writer, and president of the Sports Association. The co-founder of international, the International Consortium for, Women, for Female Sports, she has been a champion and influence in women's sports for more than 50 years. Thank you, ma'am. <laughs> Finally, we have, she allowed me to say this in English because I don't think I'd be able to pronounce her first name in, in Spanish, Irene Aguera from Spain. Irene is a lawyer and a specialist in sports law, counsel for sports federations, professional leagues, clubs, and athletes, speaker and lecturer. A member of the Spanish Sports Law Association, she has also provided counseling to, public, uh, to political parties and is a member of the Commission of the Regulatory Development of Spanish Sports Law. Irene is a strong advocate for female sports and the rights of women for, to have equal opportunities. Since 2019, she has been studying the effects of self-ID policies in sports, writing papers, advising sports federations, and this amazing panel is going to be moderated by Dr. Russ Tucker from South Africa. Come on up, because this now belongs to you. Thank you, and thank y'all all for having me here. Thank you very much, hi everyone. Uh, there are some husky voices <laughs> on this end, I don't know about you. <laughs> if we could have recorded the conversations last night, we might have just played them back on the screen. <laughs> Because I think we, we, we got to the bottom of a lot of things over the beers and wine in the bar, so that was really good to hang out with some of you. So what we have here is, a, is, in a sense, a debrief, because the five women you're looking at on stage are very much involved day to day in the deep operations, struggles, the challenges that are faced at the union level, the government level. 
So what I think would be really valuable to get out of this session is in just casual conversation, as open and, and, and candid as possible, for them to share with you some of the challenges that they faced, how they've overcome those challenges, what lessons they've learned, what works, what doesn't work, so that we can all take from this levers, buttons, and a little bit of awareness about what kind of approaches you need to take. Try and understand where people are at in order to try and address what their needs are and so forth. So that's what I want to get out of this. And, and what I'd like to do is not for me to interview. I'm not Piers Morgan. Um, <laughs> and so whoever it is who's running a microphone around, at any stage, I want to see a hand. And I would love for you to ask a question if I miss it. There are bound to be things you want to know that I can't think of asking. So please get the mics going right now. Let's not wait. But I am going to start, sort of try and break the ice and just go through these, these five and try and let them give you a picture of where they are, like literally geographically, and what the situation is where they are. So I want to start closest to me with Irene, whose name I hope I have pronounced correctly. Did I, I think you're probably being kind, but thank you. Tell us... Impressive. Tell us a little bit about what the situation is like in Spain, because I know that you have certain legal challenges that are probably going to be very difficult to overcome. So maybe tell the audience what those are and, and what your involvement has been so far. Okay, good morning, everyone. And, of course, first of all, thank you so much to ICONS for having me today and, of course, of, uh, organizing this amazing event. This is really amazing. So thank you very much. Um, so, what's the situation in Spain? In Spain, we do have males competing in female sports, and we do have female athletes who are in testosterone because they identify as uh, transgender men, competing also in female sports. The reality is that at the moment there is no sport federation that has made any policy. So you might be wondering then how is that possible? Well. There are two reasons for that. Reason number one is that they've just allowing it with no policy at all. Some sport federations have allowing it. And reason number two is legislation. Yesterday, um, uh, Ms. Kiefer was explaining that there were 22 states in the United States which had laws that protected say, uh, women's sports. In Spain, we have the opposite. Spain is divided into autonomous regions, there are 17, and they can make their own laws. So we have 12 regional laws right now that establish that anyone can choose in sport the sex category they want. Anyone. So uh, this is what is happening right now in Spain. And the situation has gone worse because this year we had the national transgender law, which is a self-ID law. This law allows anyone from 16 years old, old uh, years old on, and from 14 years old on, if they have their parents' permission, to go and change their sex recorded in their public documents. So right now, the new problem sport federations will have to face is that they will never be able to know the real sex of the person who wants to have a, a sport license because now the uh, public documents don't show a real data. Now, they show just a feeling. So that is what is happening right now. And uh, so one, one thing I'll say, certainly for the UK and even Canada and the US, is it's in the media a lot that this discussion is happening. It's a controversial issue. Is it like that in Spain? Or does this just happen and 99.9% .9 of the country is unaware that it's even happening? This is in the media, but we haven't had a, like a big case, like here, the Leah Thomas case. So we are having... Some cases, uh, for example, in Madrid, the top scorer in the regional league of the female league is, is a male. Uh, in rugby, we also have a case, but it's like it doesn't have, a, it hasn't happened something very, mm, you know, very big, very bad. So it hasn't gone that controversial, but it is on the media. And then, okay, and then my last question to you, because one, one of the themes I want to explore is the reaction of the woman athletes to this challenge. But the last question for you now is, why did you dive into this? What was the trigger for you to then say, this is wrong and I need to get involved? Well, that's, uh, that was hard for me, because I work in sport. So um, it, it's not like I'm not an athlete. I've never been, for sure. Uh, sport hasn't uh, lost anything without me being an athlete. <laughs> I, I can't tell. 
But um, it, it was hard for me because at the end uh, I worked for sport federations and this might be controversial for them because w at the point I started speaking out about this, I didn't know what was their position. <laughs> so I could lose my job. We have been hearing many women here that have lost their jobs. So I, I was at that position. So there was one day I was seeing what was happening and I talked to, talk to myself and I said, well, am I going to see how is this unfairness is happening in front of my eyes? I'm not doing anything. What will I think about myself in 10 years? This will, go, uh, be, will, this will be go worse and I will look back and say, you did nothing. That's not gonna happen. So I'm going to take action, whatever it takes and whatever it happens. So that's it. Yeah. Very good. Uh, let, let's go one, one to the right. Linda, I'm sure you can relate to what you've just heard in terms of the legislation. And I only say this because I've seen you tweet it, that you must sometimes look at your country and go, what is happening? <laughs> I've seen you tweet that, so I'm not putting yeah. words in your mouth, I hope. <laughs> but, but just tell us the situation in Canada. Well, um, you know, the American Bill of Rights, uh, James Madison, I believe, brought it in almost 200 years ago. And Canada only had their Bill of Rights come to our country in 1983 after we brought our Constitution home from the, U the UK, from Great Britain. In that Bill of Rights, sex is a characteristic upon which you cannot, you can't discriminate on the basis of sex. But then along came Justin Trudeau in 2016 and amended, brought in their own human rights law, Bill C-16, which everybody knows about because of Jordan Peterson. And it's, uh, you can't discriminate on the basis of gender identity and gender expression, which Okay, like nobody wants to discriminate against that either, but it, it was implied somehow that it's supposed to replace sex, but it didn't in fact do anything to our Charter of Rights and Freedoms, the basic, the basic constitutional sex-based provision. So we, we as a country right now sit in a tension of conflicting rights across the country. We have this foundational principle that you cannot discriminate against somebody on the basis of sex. And if you put a male body with a man into a women's sport uh, with all the male advantages, that is discrimination against a female athlete. On the other hand, the leaders of the country, because they're so afraid of the human rights legislation, presume to think that they can do that, put a man in a woman's event, because otherwise they might be violating the newer law. But it, it isn't true. Like, they, they, it's, like if, a, if a prison warden decides he wants to put a male rapist in a woman's prison, he's doing that purely on the assumption that, that that's what has to be done. But he, he's just making that arbitrary decision. It, it, they think it's compelled by law because they're being bullied into thinking it, but it's not true. And so my job, in sport is to try to go around convincing the leadership that you don't have to do this. We have, you know, you can protect women on the basis of sex, but nobody wants to test it. And they're, they're sort of like the environment is, the social media environment says, no, you gotta do this. There is one major political think tank, the McDonnell Laurier Institute, that I have to give credit to because they uh, you know, they publish stuff on, on the oil, oil and on China. Like it's a major political think tank in Ottawa and they have come out very strongly on in support of sex-based rights of women in sports. And I really want to call them out and say thank you. But I mean, we're still in the middle of it, yeah. <laughs> In 17, have I got that right? Yeah, so Bill C-16 was pr proposed in, in 2016, but it was signed into law in 2017. The reason I ask is because I wonder whether that's not an outcome of something that had been developing and evolving earlier, because as far back as 2006, yes. we had, you know where I'm going with this, was this I know. the Daniel Mountain Viking case, whose name I wrote yeah. down, because I'm so bad Michelle with Michelle Dumaresque. Yeah, and, and Danica Schroeder. Danica gets Schroeder a was a three, female athlete. Three months, maybe, maybe just relay that story. Yeah. And I just wonder your thoughts on, on the, how that, the line from 2006 goes to yeah. 2017. Yeah, that's a really interesting can point. We, can we, we have a question here? Yeah. Um, actually, my question might actually be related to what you're, the story you're about to tell. So yeah. I was just wondering about lawsuits. Uh, 
based on the Bill of Rights? Has, have any yes. been brought? And if, if not, what's happening? We're building to it. You're Let's put it that it. way. We're building to it because we have to be very careful that in, because it's in this state of limbo where it's a confl conflict of one document, foundational document, against a newer foundational document, whoever wins the first battle on it, it's going to set precedent. So if we don't have a very clear-cut case to fight, and let's say for some reason we just don't, we don't spell it out clearly and, and win, then we will be way behind because then the precedent will be set that you can discriminate against women on the basis of sex. So we, we do have to be careful, uh, but we're building to it. Yeah. Um, but the case in 2000, and basically it started in 2004 and even earlier, <laughs> Allison will probably be able to tell a mountain biker, Allison in the back can probably tell a better story, but uh, in British Columbia, the province where Allison lives, um, there was a mountain bike series and, and a league, and then they invited some of the women, the girls invited a transsexual male to do just some of the riding with them. And then because of the IOC policy of 2003, the, the transsexual's name was Michelle Dumaresque, started competing. And everybody saw that it wasn't fair, and Dumaresque was, and if you go to my Twitter, I pinned it to the tweet today, my at Coach Blade, it explains it. But basically, one after about 2000, after two years of racing and losing constantly, Danica Schroeder, who was another, a female uh, cyclist, got onto the second place spot of the podium and had written in a Sharpie on her T-shirt, uh, the first 100% female in this race or something like that. So, yeah. <laughs> and um, immediately she faced instant dis uh, disciplinary action. She was banned for six months and she was never heard from again. I've looked her up, she's a physiotherapist in uh, I think in the Okanagan somewhere. But I mean, just the early lesson and as early as 2006, Canadian women in sport learned the lesson that if you said anything, you indicated anything it was severe discipline, and you'd probably never be able to compete again or wouldn't want to, and the whole national press would be against you. And it was based on the IOC. That's why I'm always blaming the IOC, because Canada ha is a country that really likes to follow international trends. They, they see themselves as very sort of world-wise. And, and so, you know, even though it wasn't even in our law, that, that you know, it really was uh, based on the global sports ruling that they were able to shame Danica Schroeder. When you say, when you say they, and you spoke about Danica getting taught a lesson, who, who was teaching that lesson? The, the mountain bike racing sport officials. And then they took it and it was picked up by the national press. Okay, one more question here. So, sorry, I just want to, before I come to that, thank, where, where are you? Right here. <laughs> okay, I'll come there now. Sorry, I just wanted to finish this line yep. before I go there, if you, if you don't mind. Um, <laughs> Of course, no, I can't remember what it's going to ask. No, you were going to ask <laughs> who was disciplining. Yes, but the, you see, the thing is they were, they were disciplining for social protest. Yes. And that seems to me distinct from, yeah. from some sort of policy-related yeah. thing. So there was obviously something in the social milieu already mm. developing at there that was. point. There was. Obviously, there was something. And I, at that moment in 2006, or 2004 to 2006, that was exactly the moment I was actually with the United Nations in Africa with my husband. So I didn't really, I wasn't on the ground at that time. I'm only hearing stories from those days, but we, we understood that there was this underlying social tension that understanding, uh, you know, sometimes you just have this feeling of your social context that that's what's accepted and you're not supposed to say anything. And that, that started way back then, and I think, it, I think Danica Schroeder probably could have fought it in courts, but she'd rather just self-exclude self and not worry and not do it anymore because she had done it for fun, and why do it, right? Mm. She didn't have icons. <laughs> she didn't have any of the groups and standing with her. That's the difference. Mm -hmm. Yes. Yes, almost all. Yeah. Back then, I'd be incredibly surprised if there were any women back then. I mean, yeah. even now, I think it's minority. Yeah. But then Very few heads of sports organizations are women, although the, there's some. And they don't, they're not any better, I can tell you. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. They have well, that my, question. Sorry for keeping yeah, my, it. Yeah, Mike, I I apologize. I have two questions, but they both relate to what Coach Blade just said. 
The first is, I wonder if anyone can talk a little bit more about the origin story of how, of, does anybody know, I mean, yesterday we heard about Joanna Harper, is it just a few activists who, you know, how long had they planned to infiltrate women's sports? I'm, I'm, I'm curious about the, the history, the origin story. And I also wonder, I'm thinking about the, um, the Sports Illustrated story about Leah Thomas, which was incredibly sympathetic and did not give a shit about the experience for the women. And um, I just want to say I did, I pitched this story to the LA Times about um, the level playing field not being about the men and the women in the same category, but about people who can speak up versus people who can't, which of course they didn't take. Anyway, um, the, so the other question, I, I find that a lot of men seem to be somewhat sympathetic to AGPs, even if they have autogonophiles, the, the, mm -hmm. the vast majority of trans women. And, and the men are in charge. They just, I don't know why, I find a lot of men who are otherwise sympathetic to these, these issues are protective of autogynophiles in some way. Mm -hmm. And so, so how then do we, what do we do because the men are in charge? Well, it's surprising that if you really push back, because they're, they, they seem to be weak and following a social norm, if you push back hard enough, they collapse. So that's the point. We have to push back. That's the only way. Yeah. Can I also ask, uh, steer that same question to Fiona, because I know you've, you've dealt with, in excess, I would think now, 50 sports in the UK, and you might have quite a good sense for how they think, and maybe you can trace it backwards to try and answer that first yeah. part of that question. Okay. Um, thank you, Lisa. Uh, one thing I'd say is I think it's overly simplistic for us to think that if women were in charge, it would all be better. I know that we might believe that as a universal truth, but in the world of sports, I've dealt with lots of women in NGBs who are very conditioned or choosing to center the needs of a particular minority that they think need special care and attention, which is trans identifying people. The issue there and our success is in helping them reframe the question to remember that there's another group of people who also need particular consideration and that there's a category of sport created for those people. And so, um, Whatever empathy we all may have for one subgroup of society, and we do, and we need to find solutions for them to be included in sport and in society, the issue we want to talk about is the female people and how we get included. And so by reframing the question, that's, we have found quite a useful way of redirecting the empathy, but also not having to make the battleground the question of trans issues. And it's a, it a bit echoes what Helen Joyce said the other day. So, and, and in terms of the origins, I mean, other people w will know, you know, it goes all the way back to court cases and Kristen Worley and, and all those people. And the IOC really preempted what they thought was coming, which was uh, a human rights fight over the right of recognition of a transsexual to be recognized as a woman. But I think we've moved a long, long way from that now because, as I say, if you reframe the conversation, then you're, you're dealing with the human rights of different groups rather than a, a conversation which, and this is where I think men have been successful, they have got all of us talking about the needs of a particular subset of male people. And that's what we don't do anymore. We're, we're talking about other, other groups as well. When you say reframe the question, can, can I just ask you to pause on that and say, what, what tends to be the original question? What do you reframe it to? And maybe most important, to whom do you need to make that reframing? Okay, thank you. So, um, yeah, actually, the, I'll mention there's an article on our website called Leveling Down, how asking the wrong question led to bad, bad policy. Um, so when we talk to governing bodies, um, generally I first ask them, where they're up to on the issue of female inclusion and transgender inclusion. So straight away, we've identified there are two different issues here. And we're not here to battle against transgender inclusion. We're here to talk about female inclusion. So, so that's the first thing. By asking them where they are, then you find out what they already believe and what you, 
you know, what common ground you have. So, for example, as Ross said the other day, some people, the science is settled. Other people, it's not, or they, they won't believe it. So, you, so then you don't waste your energy arguing over stuff that's irrelevant. So, so the question then becomes, how do we make sure that sport is inclusive of all? That's the right question. The wrong question is, who gets to compete in the female category, and can we let some male people in there? And that implicitly is the question that, we, that, that was asked and answered without consulting us. Um, so I, I have also, I will mention one other article on our website, which is exactly that. It's, it's um, what's it called? It's called, Are There Good Reasons to Allow Some Males Into Women's Sport? Because in our conversations with all these governing bodies, we've heard so many justifications for why they've got the policies they've got. And you can imagine lots of the reasons. You've, you'll all have heard them yourselves. So it's useful to be able to um, respond to those. But the fundamental, the right questions that they should be asking themselves are, who is eligible for the female category? And once that's addressed, which to be honest is not a difficult question, how do we make sure that this sport, whichever sport it is, is inclusive of all and there's a place for everyone? Two different questions. Two things I will pick up on again in a moment, but we spoke very briefly there about women pushing back against leadership, so I'm going to use that to segue to you, Nelly, and I want you to please, thank, first of all, thank you for coming up from Mexico and for your efforts in triathlon. Will you, will you just explain to the audience the position that has brought you here yeah. and how World Triathlon's policy was evolving, got to a point, and then you said, actually, no, yeah. we need to change yeah. this? Uh, first of all, thank you very much for having me here. I I'm very, I feel very humble because uh, in Mexico we don't have any issue yet. So these two days I, I've been learning a lot and I want to, my job now is to avoid what is happening in your countries. <laughs> so I'm learning very much. And I'm here because of, of a Twitter. I'm very lucky that, that I met all these ladies and many of that are here because when World Triathlon uh, released her, uh, their, their new transgender um, policy. Um, we, the Mexican Triathlon Federation, uh, wrote a Twitter uh, telling that we are not agree with that, that uh, policy. And on the next Congress that, that took place on November 22, we will um, um, send a, a, a new a new pol uh, we will tr to try to, to do a, a new policy to protect the women's category. And thanks to that Twitter, we receive a lot of, of uh, answers from all over the world that support us. And then when we were at Congress uh, last year in Abu Dhabi, uh, we have a meeting prior, prior to the Congress with the uh, uh, General Secretary of World Triathlon, and we agree that we are going to to work from uh, today until uh, the end of 24 uh, to promote, pr uh, to work and to make some research about the, the, all the, the scientists and the, all the things that are uh, now on the, on the web or, or on everything about the transgender. And we will try to come with a new policy that is uh, 100% uh, protecting the women's category. Just, just for context and clarity, as I understand it, World Triathlon would have had the same as all other sports, the IOC's policy. And then I, I know, because I was one of the people they consulted, yeah. is they, they, they looked to make changes to it, and they even surveyed their athletes. They had an athletes commission, and they got yeah. feedback from them and then, I've lost track of time, but a few months back, perhaps, they announced a policy. That, what, what was unique about that policy? What, what change did they make? Can you just fill the audience in I, on that? I will, I will read what, how's it, what is it. Uh -huh. Wait. Um, yeah, to compete in the, fem in the female category in, in an elite or age group triathlon competition, a transgender athlete must demonstrate that the concentration of testosterone in the athlete's serum has been less than 2.5 nanomoles continuously for a period of at least four, uh, 24 months. They must also wait for at least four years 
after transitioning if they have previously competed as a male in any sporting competition. World Triathlon's policy was approved by the majority of the executive board, although notably it, uh, the vice president, Ian Howard, and president of the Athletes Committee, Thomas Todd, was votes against. So this policy was both at the executive board. And one of the things that uh, always World Triathlon is doing is that a new policy has to be voted at the Congress, and all the members has to vote. That's why um, Mexico, uh, Triathlon Mexico says, I'm not agree. We need to bring this to the Congress, and everybody has to vote. And then we decide if we are agree or not. But when we arrive to Congress, we agree that we're not going to fight because uh, World Triathlon has always been doing the things right for the women. So we are we we are we are agree with them, and we want to work to fight for uh, for uh, uh, for having the the women's rights for triathlon. So we are not fighting. We're working. We have a working group now, and we're going to take tw this uh, uh, 20, 20 months to 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 search for a new a new policy that it's better for, for the for the world tri for the tri sport of triathlon. It seems it seems to me from my perception that triathlon is very divided on this issue because that policy you've just read there reads to me like a classic compromise that makes nobody happy. Because what they what they seem to have done is they've said it used to be one year at ten. Yeah. And lowering it to two point five and making it four years to me is is almost an implicit recognition that it doesn't work but we so we know but we can't quite go far enough so yeah. we're going to come up with some soft <laughs> compromise thing that we just hope makes it go away that's that's how that looks to me because as as far as we understood we, we understood we, we think that world triathlon wants to protect but at the same time want to include so yeah. You cannot do both, it, and yes. we all see all all these two days. So exactly. it's it's complicated. Yeah. But now it's easier because we now have cycling, swimming, and athletics wow. release the new policy. So for us, it's very easy. We are swimming, cycling, and, and running. Well, so I was, <laughs> I was gonna. They, they they did the job for us. That so is. <laughs> That's going to be my next question because you've got this deadline with 2024. When when the UCI when the UCI brought its policy out, do you think anyone in triathlon went? If I'm a swimmer, I'm protecting female sport. Imperfect yeah. as this. If I if I cycle, I've protected female sport. If I run, I protect female sport. But as long as I do all three in one race, <laughs> it seems it seems yeah. an absurd yeah, position. Yeah, but but, ah. but but now you cannot race. You cannot race until four years. So, right. so we, we are now they are protected. And we are working on doing that before the four years. That's yeah. the truth. Yeah. Right. And then my last, sorry, my last question, and then there's a question at the back. I will come to you. Just, I want to know my last question from you is, since you put that forward and you stood up and said no to this, have you found allies within triathlon, or do you feel alienated? Is there support, or are you fighting alone? No, we, are, we found a lot of allies. The thing is, nobody wants to talk. That's the, as we, so we, we have uh, many allies. And you saw on the, on the Twitter, on Twitter for, for the World Triathlon, everything was, oh, you did wrong, bad decision, blah, blah, blah. For us was, thank you, you did, you did great, you're so brave. So everybody w knows what, what is right, but nobody wants to do the job. That's the truth. <laughs> so, so I think your characterization of it as sort of a bad compromise is, is, of course, spot on. But there were two things in what you read that I'm not sure that I heard right, and I'm wondering if it matters, and words matter a lot. So yeah. one of them is you can't co have competed as a male in, it sounded like you said any sport, yeah. so it wouldn't just be triathlon. So well, if you, it's just triathlon. Just try. Okay. Yeah. And the other thing was when it when it said you have to have your testosterone below whatever nanomoles, 2. right? 5. Yeah. 
But it said, I thought you said that, that you have, that the athlete has to show that it was continuously below for 24 months. Yeah. Which is very different from the way other policies are written, which say the athlete has to have had it below for X number of months. So if that's the case, how does the athlete have to prove that? We don't know yet that. <laughs> <laughs> but that's a huge difference. Yeah. So even though it's not a good policy and it still is a compromise, that, I would think, could be used in such a way that would say, if you cannot prove this and it is con continuous and the burden is on you, the athlete, then that should help some-ish, yeah. maybe. Yeah, maybe. But Possibly, yes. Good question. Yeah. Good I observations. Don't a, I, don't, uh, I don't have an answer. Yeah. That's the truth because uh, as I said, this is all new for everybody and for triathlon. Uh, we don't have now in, in the history of triathlon, nobody that wants to, to, to race as trans athletes. So we are trying to avoid everything, but we, we, we don't have any experience of this. And we are, you, you, as compare us uh, swimming, biking or running, we are a very small federation. I'm paraphrasing a little bit of what you said, and I want to ask Ro this question. If everyone knows what is right and no one is willing to speak, then what is the way in which we amplify the voice and embolden people? Because you've obviously been involved in this issue. You've had formed two different organizations. It seems to me that those are going to be the vehicle by which change is going to come about. And I wonder if you could speak very quickly first about the context in Australia and New Zealand that led to those bodies being formed and then your experience of trying to give momentum to the voice of the woman to argue for what is right. Yeah, look, it's really tough in Australia and New Zealand. I feel, feel like we're on a race to the bottom of erasing women's rights. We had sex self ID passed legislation went through in June this year, and basically now if women, we did man manage to get one carve out in it, and that meant that women could fight for sex-based rights, but we have to fight for it in every single instance. And they did promise, too, that they would review it in five years. Well, how are they going to review, you know, the implications of it? Um, in Australia, there's also in some states, sex self-ID legislation has passed. Our Human Rights Act in New Zealand, our Human Rights Commissioner has redefined what sex is in the Human Rights Act, even though the Human Rights Act clearly says sex. They, they're interpreting it as gender identity. In Australia, the Sex Discrimination Act has actually taken sex out of it, and it is gender identity, so there are no protections for women now. And it, yeah, it's been really, really frustrating process. I mean, now a young, young girl, if she wants to go and play a sport, can't even ask if it's female only. It's not allowed. And, and with our sports policies, so both Sport New Zealand and the Australia and Institute of Sport have both passed um, self-ID policies. And New Zealand's one, you know, males can ID in and out of sports. So one day they can turn up and play as a female, and the next day they can turn up and play as a male. They can live as a male their entire life, but for the purposes of that sport, they can turn up, self-identify into the female category, and no one can say anything. If the sports question them, that is discrimination, and they could basically take a case. If females raise concerns about it, that's bullying and harassment, and they can... Be, you know, be sanctioned by their sport. It's, yeah, it's really, really tough. And unfortunately, Kiwis are, I used to think Kiwis and Aussies, like we were really strong, like common sense, straight talking people. I don't know what's happened to us over recent years. We have become the most compliant, soft, frustrating, like it really is frustrating. So how do we give them courage in speaking out? Yeah, we did some polling earlier this year and showed only 16% of Kiwis were in support of self-ID. How many? What percent? 16. Oh. So by far the majority, I think 67% were opposed to males competing in female sport if they identified as transgender, opposed to them in female changing rooms. Majority, even of the parties that passed this legislation, but the media refused to discuss it with us. Yeah, we have broadcasting standards authority in New Zealand now that is so strict in terms of what the media, mainstream media are allowed to say that they are scared to interview me in case I say something wrong and they get done by the BSA. So saying any language that 
that is based in, in biology is not acceptable. And so, yeah, it's really, Ross. really tough. Ross. In, in a race, thank you, I'll come to you, Nan thanks Nancy. In a race to the bottom then, step by step, small steps, no one notices, no one notices. It, and maybe this is an unfair question and you can't ask because you haven't been involved long enough to know what it came from. Is it apathy? Is it active campaigning against? Is it fear? Like oh, what look, do you think is innate? What are the fear, enablers for the, these is a big steps thing. to be so, taken? Yeah, so we had obviously Laurel Hubbard was pretty, you know, international. But locally, like we had a male who identified into the female category. He, he participated as a male up until the end of one year. Three weeks later, he came back and he started participating in the female category. This was in downhill mountain biking. And, the, you know, the policy changed over the three weeks. None of the female athletes would, had any idea that this was happening. He went from being a mediocre male to winning the women's downhill nationals. And one of the, the one of the women who had been a number two world, like junior world downhill national rider, came second to him and questioned Cycling New Zealand about it. She, her and her father, her father was a three-time like coach for years and years, and I think he's won three medals as well. They questioned Cycling New Zealand about it, and all they got back was, "Look, Shania just needs to focus on her own training." It was, it was appalling. She got piled on on social media. She withdrew from her sport because the process she went through was so horrific. But what that did is that set the example for all the other girls in cycling, don't you dare say a word. And what it's meant, I think Holly mentioned that, you know, you stop participating in the events that those males are in. That's what's happening in New Zealand. We're seeing this person has won, I think, in the last few years, over $8,000 of female prize money. Now, when you're in community sport, that prize money, when you win, helps you actually get into the next events because, you know, it's, it's really expensive, these sports. And unless you've got wealthy families, you rely on that prize money to help on your pathways. But yeah, it's, oh, I don't know, it, it's quite depressing. So the girls are very, very scared to speak up about it, and that fear is what keeps everyone silent. Yeah, it's, it's difficult not to see patterns repeating all over the world, right? It seems to me the, the mark of a very effective campaign to get 16% of people to hold an axe over 84% of people and make the 84 frightened of the, the 16. Yes. So what are the levers that have been used and can we reclaim those levers? Yeah, so <laughs> it's very hard, like in New Zealand, we can't even place an ad in the newspaper. The newspapers will not accept our, our advertising. So, for instance, a group last week tried to put, place an ad in the paper saying, what is a woman? And just had a link to whatisawoman.nz. All the newspapers, like they first of all they accepted the ad, then every one of them cancelled it. We can't put up a billboard with woman, adult, human, female, without it being taken down within sort of 24 hours. Our Facebook page is throttled. You know, we've got double the amount of followers that we had probably two or three years ago but we get such little reach. I even did some advertising last week and I reached like 32 people. <laughs> and like this is paying to get it boosted. And so getting the message out, like we have to talk to each other. We need to build our database and contact people that way. But I think the more and more it's happening now, because it is at, at every level of sport, the more it's triggering people. And unfortunately, until it impacts people, they don't think it's a problem. They just think we should be kind and we should be inclusive. But when it actually impacts them directly, then they go, what? <laughs> this is not right. Yeah. So, yeah. Well, you said, you said to me last night, you have a fear that it would literally take worst case scenario. And New Zealand and Australia are, are pretty big sports in the, in the contact world sports. And so we're looking at that scenario. That's, that's the doomsday situation. Yeah, no, our fear is that it, we it's going to take way more than a Leah Thomas or an Austin Killips. We actually believe in Australia and New Zealand a girl is going to have to be disabled or killed before our leaders have the guts to actually do something right. I, I mean, it's going to sound terribly pessimistic, but when we did the world rugby policy, safety was put at the number one priority and it was communicated that we have these concerns about it. And a number of different people from around the world said, but that happens anyway. When we raised the point that there'd be an increase in concussion risk and potentially catastrophic injuries, spinal cord injuries, death, and they said, but that happens in men on men, that happens in women on women. So <laughs> I dare but, but, suggest but, but, that they'll still, they'll just sidestep yeah. risk assessment. But, what, but what's really ironic, so New Zealand Rugby Union reject, rejected World Rugby Union's guidelines, and they've created a self-ID policy that they're still consulting on. We've managed to hold it off for a while. But, you know, they created an under-55 
kilogram like set category for the males, so they wouldn't get injured. The smaller males wouldn't get injured in the male category, but they're going to open up the female category. Yeah, it's absolutely incoherent. Nancy, I'm sorry I kept you waiting so long. Your, your question was? Well, yeah, yeah, yeah. So I, I do have a question. Okay. Slightly off topic in, in that um, I'm curious as to when, so you were reading your, the, the policy out loud and somebody's got to not have competed as a male for four years. And so what I'm wondering is, has anybody done the timeline for like all the IOC's policies and how long that essentially the policy like wouldn't allow anybody to compete for two years, right? So when they said 2.5 animals for two years, right? It's like, whew, okay, we're good for two years, right? And then like, I'm just wondering how often that these policies actually just kick the can down the road. No, the thing is that when um, we, we're working now, we have a working work group yeah. uh, confirmed from uh, the many people from World Triathlon, from uh, America, Asia, Europe, um, Oceania, and from every committee, coach committee, uh, athletes committee, medical committee, uh, uh, women's committee, we're, we're working every every month. Uh, there's also a girl here from New Zealand who is in that uh, on that working group. Uh, Anna, yes, and um, we we're, we we have have this meeting every month, and we are inviting. That's why I, I am here also because I want to invite and some of the experts to talk in that meetings, and we are going to decide what to do before that two, month, two years, so we can do a new policy that protect the women's category. That's, that's the purpose. So, and then just in addition to that, Linda, you'd know this, because you, you even explained it yesterday, so I should probably have remembered it, but it was initially, remember, surgery, then two years. Then it was yeah. testosterone reduction, then one year. So in actual fact, each change has made it more tolerant, not more, so it's, Less a case of kicking the can down the road is reeling the can in. Well, after Leah Thomas, though, they started going lower testosterone longer again, like the world's and, and that's And that's why the four years, very low, seems to me to be, they've actually all recognized They're it, all. but they can't quite. They, so it's, it's like now we know, we just can't make the choice that we should be making. I think that's the problem. Uh, Catherine, um, and then I saw Helen had a hand, and Mara as well. Sorry if I've missed the order there. And Tracy, sorry. I just wanted to say something further to what Rose said, and she's absolutely right. Um, I had a meeting with the New South Wales Minister for Sports Office, uh, back with the old government, and I was told by a bureaucrat that a woman or girl would have to die before they took me seriously. So, you know, we're seeing women injured. We had the guy who's playing soccer. He knocked a girl into the fence. I believe she was knocked out. He just turned his back and walked away. Like, there was no, no punishment for him. He put three girls, um, injured three girls in another game. Like, they don't care. They, they don't care in Australia. It's absolutely heartbreaking. I don't want it to all be depressing, though. Like, we have had one win so far. <laughs> Boxing New Zealand <laughs> protected the female category. <laughs> and, and I'm feeling confident that some other sports will do the same as well. So, it, like, it's, it's coming from the government, a lot of this, and so it's up to the sport, our sports leaders to actually have the courage to, to do what's right by females, and I'm hoping that more and more of them will do. Yeah. yeah. Uh, while we're here, Tracy had a question, and then we're going to go to Helen and Myra. Thanks very much. This is great engagement. Thank you. First, a comment, having grown up in such admiration of New Zealand and Australia, I always thought they were the leaders doing everything right. So this hurts. Um, the, the, the question goes back to the absolute beginning. You said 14 and 16 years of age, they can change. They can self-ID on, on paper, and that's what they have to do. What about the, uh, the medicalization age-wise in Spain? Um, have they allowed parents to allow their kids to, to change, their, change their sex physically at that age? 
I'm not really an expert on, on that field because I've always focused my studies in the sports area. As far as I know, I think because this is a regional, uh, regional thing, it's regulated by those regional laws, if I'm not mistaken. And as far as I know, as I know, I've know about, I've knew about, I've known about cases. Sorry, I've known about cases of medicalization in children. So, I guess it's it's a lot. Okay. Uh, and then Mara, and then we're going to carry on with some 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 other themes I'd like to explore with these five on stage. Helen, thanks. Thanks. So I thought Fiona's point about reframing so that you move on to the territory that we, we can compete on and we can talk on is a very important one. And that's true right across the board. So whenever somebody says, you know, but are you, are you misgendering or are you disrespecting this person's identity? You can say, I'm not talking about identities at all. I'm talking about bodies. And another thing that we need to do is to basically give up hope of people deciding to be nice to us. You know, it's so obviously that this it's so obvious that this is unfair and cruel to women and we're waiting too long for people to see that and to do the right thing. So I think we just need to like Christiana said yesterday, we need to pick our cases, we need to go on the attack. It's better when you take the case than when you have to defend the case. And I think the answer right now for sports is probably insurers. So I wouldn't be waiting for sports bodies to notice that they're putting women at risk. I'd be going straight to insurers and saying, have you seen this? Do you understand that you're underwriting this, this sport? Uh, have you done the risk assessment on this? I would be doing this across the economy as well. I would be getting in touch with pharmaceutical firms, anyone you know who was on a board, anyone who's a CEO, and saying, do you understand that children are being put together in sleeping accommodation where one of them can get someone pregnant and the other one can get pregnant? Do you understand that there are going to be lawsuits on um, medicalizing children? Do you understand that women are likely to get their necks broken? You're the ones who are underwriting this. You're the people who are signing off on the books of this company. You're the person who could end up in court if you've got fiduciary duty. You're the people who'd be paying out millions of dollars. Can you do a damn risk assessment? Helen, we have a different structure in New Zealand. Can, can I just add very, very quickly, one of the tools that's worked really well for me to get people to listen, to get organizations to listen, is you write your letters now to New Zealand Rugby, you state all the science, and you make sure they're aware that they have the knowledge that they are allowing dangerous sport to happen. So when there is someone who breaks their neck, you make them bankrupt, okay? And then that goes back to the insurance. So you're coming at it in a very powerful kind of way where you're almost saying, well, not, we're not going to play the kind game. We're going to play the nasty game. Because so it's the only way that works. Yeah, no, I agree. We have an, the added complexity in New Zealand that we don't have the insurers. We have an accident compensation corporation that is government funded, government funded, employer funded, et cetera. So, the, yeah, so I contacted the ACC right at the beginning and I was working really constructively with them, but they started working with New Zealand Rugby and South ID still went through. So, so just very quickly on that, um, because when we held our guideline consultation process, we invited the two primary insurance companies that underwrite World Rugby. Because of, the, because of the contact sport landscape and the risk of head injuries and later in life, we, we basically meet insurance companies quarterly and we have to explain to them that we're managing all the risks and doing what needs to be done. Not to get to zero risk, because no one wants that, but to get to acceptable risk. And so they sat in on those workshops and we said to them at the end, now you've heard the legal, the scientific, the human rights. Would you underwrite and ensure, even at the community level, women to play rugby where they'd be walking onto the field, not necessarily even knowing that they might play against a male? And <laughs> being actuaries, they said it depends about a thousand times. But eventually said, no, we don't think that you can justify this. So that was one of the things that was fundamental to the, to the guideline that we issued. Then what happened was we went to the unions with it, and as, as you may know, most of them rejected it, at least initially, Eventually, some started to accept it. One of the unions said, the risks of that happening, that being the catastrophic, are so low, whereas the risks of a lawsuit, if we don't allow trans women to play, are much higher, and we'd rather take that risk than the... Yeah. We'd rather take the low risk. And anyway, the point I'm trying to make is, in human behavior, humans are really good at assessing and understanding risks that are low in consequence but frequent, and really bad at understanding risks that are rare but very consequential. And I do wonder whether part of it is, in Catherine's case, 
It's that they don't care because they don't need to. They don't think. They can't, they can't see past that horizon. And they just say, carry on. Because the, the immediate thing is the only thing they can worry about. It's can a, I say something really barrier. quickly? Yeah. So I had a, in 2018 when be, I became aware of this and I was gung-ho and I had a meeting with the president of my sports association. I took him to dinner and I said, we have to protect females. And he, he wouldn't say anything. He looked down at his hands and I said, okay, but I know what you're thinking. You're thinking that you don't want to be sued by a male person coming into, by a man coming into women's sport. And I said, but don't you understand that there's 50 times more females who could sue you? And he said to me, I quote, girls wouldn't do that. This is what's got to change. That's when I became an activist. That's when I became, <laughs> you think girls won't do that? You're talking to female athletes who are fighters. What are you thinking? Yeah, but it's our fault. Sorry? It's our fault. We need to start doing something. We need something. to do it, yeah. <laughs> Yeah, but, but I really do think they just say, oh, it's a one in a billion. And they don't understand that it's imminent. But that's, that's one of the things needs to be communicated. Mario, sorry to keep you. Yeah, thank you. I had an observation and a question. So the observation is that I, I see a little bit of the notion or the claim that to be an elite athlete is a sort of luxury career choice. So, so why are their needs important? And obviously I disagree. <laughs> um, but I can kind of see where that view is coming from. But elite female athletes are also kind of public goods in that they, you know, inspire other people to do sport. And so I think elite female athletes should exist. So have you got any... And, and another sort of related position is people who clearly don't do sport have no interest in sport. So, for example, last week, the chair of UK Stonewall, Ian Anderson, was interviewed. And it got onto sport, and the interviewer said to him, with a photo of Leah Thomas, you know, surely you can see that it's unfair. And his first response was to sort of scoff and go, I'm not very good at sport. <laughs> like, as if that's relevant. Um, so how do, we, how do we sort of persuade people who, you know, think to be an elite athlete is just a luxury or who have no interest in sport. And then the second thing is um, thinking about where we might be in five to ten years' time on this. So when the IOC required surgery um, for com males to compete in the female category, that led to Kristen Worley's case, and you know athletes can claim, you made me have surgery, this is a human rights violation. And the same with testosterone suppression for the DSD athletes. Now we have... Um, world Aquatics, World Athletics saying no male puberty in the female category, which, which obviously is good, but in five to ten years' time, are we going to see boys who've been transitioned, maybe, you know, by their parents, in order to be great athletes in the female category, suing federations, the IOC, and are we just going to get bogged down in more and more litigation? And the sort of follow on from that is can you see a point where the federations say no males of any description whatsoever in the female category and in fact Linda kind of made this point in your one page sort of thoughts on the Semenya decision so anybody <laughs> can I just make the point right, that, um, yeah, sure. um, in Australia the um, Australian um, CEO of the Australian Sports Institute of Sport they have made self-ID in the elite category as well, so even elite isn't protected. Males have to um, take the testosterone down to 2.5 nanomoles per milliliter over 24 months, but or two years, yeah, but it's not, there's no testing regime there. And interestingly, they, they launched the policy and then they said any females who had concerns could come and talk to him, but his quote was, let us assure you no woman will be disadvantaged by this. Uh, yeah, I'd like to answer the, the second question regarding the, the poverty issue. Uh, we were talking uh, about this yesterday. Uh, uh, from my point of view, uh, they have solved a problem, but they've generated another one. And of course, it's a good step because they've guaranteed in a majority the female category, but not the, in, in the whole. So 
it's, uh, it's a little victory, but it's not the end of the battle. When I talk with sport federations about this issue, uh, of course, I'm not a biologist, I'm, I'm not a doctor, so I do an approach to this issue from a logical point of view. So I ask the sport federations, uh, look, you have to regulate your own sport, and you have to ask yourself what is important uh, to categorize your sport, what criteria would have to be by objective criteria you have to follow in order to categorize. So uh, I do a kind of um, a tree of decision. I don't know if it's, if it's correct in, in English. So uh, ask yourself, is the age, uh, uh, does the age affect to your sport? If the answer is yes, then you should categorize by sex, by age. And if the answer is no, then you shouldn't categorize by age. And the same works for sex. Does the sex affect your sport? Maybe it, it does exist a sport that is not sex affected. I don't know all the sports. But if the answer is yes, you should categorize by sex. If the answer is no, you shouldn't categorize by sex. But what it doesn't make sense is to categorize by sex and then allowing a person from one sex to take part in the category of the another sex. Because by categorizing by sex, you are uh, recognizing that sex affects your sport. Then going back to the poverty thing, uh, in order to make in an exception, which I of course don't agree with, uh, because if sex matters, it does, in order to allow a person who is male but hasn't gone through poverty to take part in the female category, first of all, I would need to have not a single doubt that there is no difference between a male and a female person. Yesterday, uh, Gregory was uh, talking about all of these differences. Um, uh, I would like to have uh, heard, and this is a question I, I really have, because I really think there are another differences between males and females, uh, apart from the strength, apart from uh, 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 the power, the velocity, is, it, is that right? Yeah. Uh, that also lead to a female disadvantage. And I can uh, cite as examples, uh, menstruation is a disadvantage. And males won't have menstruation, not even if they don't go through poverty. Also pregnancy. In order to be pregnant, you need your body. So it happens that for sport, you need your body. It's the same too. Okay, <laughs> so uh, if an, a female athlete, of course, there are many female athletes who know better than me. Uh, I insist, I've never been an athlete. Um, if you are pregnant, then you have to stop your sport career, then your body changes a lot, then you have to come back. Okay, a male person will never have uh, gone uh, uh, through this. Unless the female athlete has a female partner who is willing to be pregnant. If she wants to make a family, the one who is going to get pregnant is she. So these are also advantages. The poverty doesn't fix this thing. And I will add another thing, and it's an, an, an ethical issue. Sport is about fairness, it's about integrity, and it's about health. And aren't these policies maybe um, pushing little children whose, of course, their, their dreams are to compete and maybe there is a little boy whose dream uh, is to compete in the female category. Are these policies pushing these people to take bad decisions at a very short age? I remember when, um, when Aquatics announced its decision, it did get some criticism for the Tanner 2 stipulation that it put in there, and the criticism was exactly that. It said that you're actually going to be part of the incentive to drive this earlier transition and intervention. So an important point. Did you want to respond to Mara's? Yeah. Because, and, and then, okay, I'll, I'll ask you something after it if you don't already cover it okay. in response. So I was going to say something about compromise. So we know that these policies were adopted with no consultation of women athletes, with no scientific evidence, with really not much thought at all other than the needs of a few people with difficult lives shorthanded like that. And now we're having to fight so damn hard and make the case over and over and over to get these policies rolled back. So that's mighty frustrating, but look at the progress we've made. And actually, listening to New Zealand is so depressing. 
but we'll maybe talk in a minute about the UK where honestly I think you can see a path through and the great thing about sport is because it's international there is a cascade effect so you know that's going to help so coming back to Mara's point about policies you know they're they're partial the changes the rollbacks have been partial you know it's only elite not not the rest or it's only post puberty not pre puberty or whatever um what I see a lot with governing bodies is, and, and I think Ross illustrated it well with, with describing how they're adding to the requirements. You know, it's more years of testosterone suppression. It's a lower number. All of that is proof that they know they made a terrible mistake, just in a heartbeat, and maybe in some cases even with good intentions. And now they have to find a way to dig themselves out of it. And they're afraid. They're finding it very difficult. And they're also continuing to center the group of people that they made that policy for, which is not us. One of the things that, that we have found really helpful, so I've mentioned a couple of things about, about reframing, but also about, the, the curious thing is, a lot of people don't care about women, but they care about subsets of women. So they care about girls sometimes coming through, talent pathway future Olympians. It's kind of really emotive. People care. Some people care about that, if they care about sport. Some people care about um, disadvantaged girls or people, women from ethnic minorities who are find it very difficult to be healthy by, through, through accessing sports. So, for example, in the UK, Muslim women need single-sex swimming. It's not competition. It's not to win prizes. It's to get in the pool and be active. So we have found that... Um, if the, if, the, if the issue we're dealing with here is the pinnacle of victimhood, right, and who are perceived to be the most vulnerable groups, the ones that we all have to center, if that's the issue we're dealing with, then actually taking some other um, subsets of womanhood and, and centering them can actually trigger a, a much more constructive response. It's not a battle between all us hateful witches and the poor, poor trans people. It's genuinely competing needs of different minorities with who all deserve our compassion and our care. So like the Muslim women, they need single sex swimming. Identity doesn't help them. Or so like the teenage girls, very talented in their sport who want to play up into the women's team because that's how they get to progress. But if there's a male person bowling at them or uh, you know, kicking the ball or whatever, that's hopeless for, the, for them and they're not safe and they can't play. So who, who is more important in that situation? They're both important, so let's remember that and find solutions. So in New Zealand, we tried to have a single sex, a swimming pool set up a single sex um, session specifically, so it was close to the, the Christchurch Moss. I don't know if you all remember the attacks. So they set up the single sex session, they went through a really good consultation, had it all ready to go, and then the activist contacted them and it was gone. So even Muslim women needing their own spaces does not counter the needs of entitled males. I, I'm gonna. I want to make sure we get. I'm over. Here. <laughs> I want to make sure we get one last question. And one of the, the purpose of the international panel is to represent the voices of, of women and what's going on all around the world. Sport is such a unifying, a universally unifying human celebration, and um, the idea that we could have such huge discrepancies around the world in the way governing bodies are, are respectful in treating women who want to compete in sport and be a part of that celebration is a part of the reason for putting this panel together. I am hopeful that the international governing bodies or that women speaking up all around the world with all of you here will be able to do a, you know influence a top-down approach because we can't have some countries represented on the Olympic stage are at these grand celebrations of what humans are capable of bringing some women competing against male athletes from other countries. Can we just have a little bit of discussion about why that's important to have you know, a universal place where women are recognized for their accomplishments and how we get there? <laughs> I don't know if that's a good question. I just want to make sure we talk about it. In, it was briefly touched on by Fiona, I think, when she said, you know, we have, we have competing policies around the world, and yet we're going to have to bring everyone together for events like the Olympics. 
Yes, so let me uh, steer that one first via Linda, because I know you've, you've literally been around the world in sports, so yeah. I figure you'd have a perspective from all four corners, and then I'll come to Fiona, and anyone else who wants to contribute, please just let me know. Yeah, grassroots female sport is very fragile in many countries, and all it's going to take is one or two variables that knock women or girls, have them either self-exclude or they just get discouraged and leave. And you're not gonna get the best of the best young women coming through to be profiled on the, on the world stage. And um, Nelly, I know you didn't really mean it when you said you didn't have a problem in Mexico. You do, no. yeah. because any Mexican woman who has to go international and then start competing against a male athlete is gonna be affected anyway, yeah. right? That's yeah. why you're concerned. Yeah, what, yeah. what I mean is yeah. he, being here for me, it's open in my eyes. Yeah. So yeah. we, we have to go back, uh, go back to basics, One, <laughs> men and women, <laughs> that's yeah. it. Yeah. And we didn't do anything yet about that, right. so we have to do, yeah. <laughs> Fiona, did you have a response to Kim's? Um, yeah, I, I wanted to um, just say something slightly broader about, about how, we, how we change minds, because we are changing minds. So, you know, around the world, there are some very, very challenging situations, and I want to leave us with a little bit of optimism. So um, right now, there's a review going on in Ireland, and it's being conducted for Sport Ireland by the same consultants who conducted the UK Sports Council's review, which gave us, two years ago, um, a, a document that says, rounds up all the science. It's, this is by the Sports Council's, uh, Council Equality Group. It rounds up all the science. It says you cannot balance these things, you know, as John talked about fairness, equality, uh, fairness, inclusion, safety. That's not a question of balancing them. You have to choose between fairness for women and girls or inclusion in the female category of, of trans identifying males. You can't have both. But of course, you can have inclusion of trans people in your sport, but not in the female category while retaining fairness. And that was a catalyst. And, and that is such a great, objective, independent piece of work paid for by the government that we refer everyone to that, including international federations. And we know that international federations are looking at that. We know that. They tell us that. And so it's a resource for all of you, too, because it, it's, a, it's a something that you can point to that is from an activist group. It's government funded, it's independent. So um, that's one thing. Um, the other thing is I wanted to give you a couple of examples of where I have literally heard people change their minds, right? Um, so one is, uh, a, a, um, I won't name the sports, but these are people from governing bodies in senior positions. By the way, not diversity and inclusion people. They don't change their minds. They deal with one group at a time and they're on a mission. All the evidence from the Sports Council Equality Group work and from all of our experience, I think, is that it's people who really run sport and who know about sport, who understand this, get this, and are willing to take a position. The diversity people, they're on a different mission, right? So, so I, I mostly um, find that it's when I talk to chief executives or board members or, or directors of participation or whatever that we, we see change. But I did have one conversation with a diversity guy, been in that professionally his whole life, and while we talked, he said, and he was in a quite a rough sport, it was like I could hear the, the cogs moving in his head. He said, oh, hold on, this is quite challenging for me because, you know, I've always been about increasing inclusion, and now you're telling me that maybe inclusion of trans people in the women's, ma males in the women's team could lead to exclusion of females? Yes, yes, <laughs> you've got it. But, and he said, this is uncomfortable for me. But it's quite important, it's good that he said that, but it's a really significant thing because we keep banging on about how so-called inclusion can lead to exclusion or to self-exclusion, and a lot of people just simply haven't thought about it. So that's one thing. The other thing, um, the other um, example, and I know this one, this chief executive has widely shared her experience with other chief executives and governing bodies, because they're all in these WhatsApp groups, you know, talking about their issues. At the beginning of the conversation, I said, tell me about where you are, what's your position, what's your policy, how did you get there? And she mentioned that it was kind of a feeling of guilt, that there weren't very many trans women around, that they really, really wanted to play with the women, 
and she felt a bit guilty if she wasn't going to let them do that. Now, we might have a view on that, but because she obviously didn't know what the women thought. But some of the women probably felt a bit the same pressure to just be, in, you know, be kind. By the end of our conversation, she volunteered this. She said, I don't feel guilt anymore. And her sport in England changed its policy and is now completely protected in the female category. Yeah. And I will mention that she then moved on to a bigger sport where we expect to see some change. So, yeah. So I just want maybe a little bit as a, a counter and a bit of hope for, for Roe. Yeah. And, and we know, too, that these sports, that, you know, in different sports, different national governing bodies are very influential at the international level. Yeah, so, so a change in just a couple of countries can be a catalyst, first upwards and across and down. So that's why we're going to win. Yeah. So I'm glad that you've, you've shifted it, because I think there is a tendency that we can dwell on the negatives and the challenges and the barriers and so on, and you stare at the wall so long and you forget to realize that there's a window and, or a door, or make a door. <laughs> so to go with the sports analogy, if this was a half-time talk, it'd be very easy to get despondent and talk only about the goals we've conceded, the points we've conceded. But we've actually scored a lot. A year ago at the same meeting, there was no policy in athletics, there's no policy in cycling. UK sports, probably twice as many. So there's so much progress. So what I'd like to end with in the last sort of three or four minutes before we run back on that field for the second half is for each of you to share some of the tactics that are going to help us win the second half also. I think you've done a really good job of that now. But I want, you spoke about getting boxing in New Zealand, which I imagine was a significant wall to climb. Yeah. How, does, how does that play out? And can you share with us some of the things you think will unlock the defence? <laughs> Well, I'm really hoping that triathlon may come on board and protect the female category. I'm pretty sure swimming will in New Zealand. I think it's, it's going to be a bit of a domino effect, and I know that there's a lot of fear in New Zealand about the pushback that they'll get from media, etc. But I just think once some sporting leaders start being brave, it will give other sporting leaders the opportunity to do the right thing as well. And I'm sure they will. It's just going to take a little bit of time. I just also want to add something really important, like, and why this is such a global movement is that in New Zealand most of our elite female sportswomen actually come through the college system in the US. Yeah. So for instance, in, for instance, the FIFA Women's World Cup is on right now, 53% of the women in the New Zealand team went to college in the US. So like we it's the are... the same for the UK. Yeah, same for the UK. Like I think you have nearly 30% of your um, NCAA um, like college athletes are from are international. So we are all in this fight, you know, you might think it's just an American thing, like fighting for you know, sex-based rights in the NCAA, but you're fighting for us too, and we're, and we're cheering for you because it has such an impact. Yeah. Yeah, good. <laughs> Nelly, you're, you're involved, obviously, now you've, you've said, may, maybe they'll move this timeline forward now because of cycling, who knows? But your, th your last parting thoughts to give a message of encouragement and approach to people. Yeah, but I, I, I will go from here with a lot of hope because we can, we can do, uh, we can, uh, the, the countries that are with the problem now can go back, but the countries with, like me, that, like my that doesn't have the problem yet, at the, with po we don't have any policy and the, our uh, uh, com uh, Olympic Committee, it doesn't, it, it, it starts to work on that. And we were, uh, as triathlon, we were pushing them to do a policy about transgender, but now I don't think we have to push them. We have to stay as we are, because we, in every sport now in Mexico, we have female and male category. And the only thing that I think we have to do is to keep that, uh -huh. Keep strong with that and, and um, show how a male, a, a transgender athlete ha can uh, uh, race in, a, in, in, in her age group or in her age uh, category. So uh, w we have to, to stand up for the, for the woman category. Can I add to that, like just to continue? Yeah, of course, of course. So the, this is an area, as in many different areas of life these days, where leadership is hap has to happen from below. So in, a, in my case, 
I was the president of a province uh, of track and field in the province of Alberta. I put in place our own sex-based uh, eligibility so that when I went to the national meeting, they're all looking at my policy. This is how I should word it. Yeah. So because we need to actually be positive in saying we need to help the, fri the frightened leadership. We have to help them understand how to do it. And so lead from the below, from the bottom. And then secondly, um, and I hate to <laughs> call out Catherine Deves, but I really, honestly, the future is somebody like Kath Deves. Kath, you, Kath is going to be a, a, a member of the Australian Parliament or Senate one of these days. <laughs> Stand up. That's our future, and I'm right now in, 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 in a process of engaging in the National Political Party, and we're going to get it into the party platform, and if we ever form a government, there might be some... I'm going to uh, look to Fiona for help in how to do a new equality type act or a, a, to get the sex-based things in there, the, the breakouts or whatever, sex-based provisions. Uh, we were even joking at the waiter last night. <laughs> Ro, Kath, and myself, Australia, New Zealand, Canada, and we joked at the waiter that this is the this was the table that was going to change Canada, Australia, New Zealand all at once and politically. Can I can I just if this is a, if this was a halftime team talk in soccer and, and you were in my change room, you would be I've seen you on Twitter and you, 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 the tenacity you have, you'd be the midfield enforcer. Yes. On the Here team. we go. And I know you'd be, the, you'd be the player my opposition was most nervous about facing, so. <laughs> <laughs> yes, so. because we're going to win. We're going to, we will not. Like, we are three points behind. We're going to get the three points and win. We are, yeah, and win. Very good. Yeah. And then, Irene, hey, last word from Europe. Let's, uh, let's hear some thoughts from you. And then I, I didn't mean to read, but I noticed that you'd written some things down. I wonder if you might read those in closing as well. Yes, because uh, for me, it's, uh, this is a quote really important because it comes from a, a person that I, I really appreciate. And, uh, but before saying this, um, it's, uh, I really want to remark how are we here uh, where we are. There is still a long way to go, but we have achieved so many things. And it's because of speaking out. It's also because of having uh, brave sport entities, such as World Rugby, who took the lead, because at that moment no one was doing so, and because of speaking out. Because when uh, I've, I've realized that attending events uh, in Spain where sport entities uh, come, there is so many people coming to me saying, Irene, you are right. Irene, you are so brave. Irene, I fully agree with you. But they remain silent. So w th this whole time we have been a vast majority being in silence. And that's how while we've been in silence, another minority have been speaking out Lies, lies like you can change sex or you can choose sex or male advantage can be suppressed. And that's how we are here where we are. But we are reverting that situation and it's because of speaking out. And this is how, why I have this quote because I wouldn't like to read it, uh, but uh, the, co the quote is the following. Don't fear the mob, say the truth, the support will come. Linda Blade. Thank you, Linda. And on that note, I think there's a break. Is it until 11? Yes. Kim? Thank you so much. To yeah, this I'd like to panel. just join me in thanking these five warriors. <laughs> and. Uh, With, with luck and persistence and your contribution, the next time you see these five, we'll be celebrating the victory even more after the second half. So thanks very much. Feel free to chat further to them and learn from them. Thank you all. See you see back you at 10.50. Take a break. Give everyone good breaks today. Um, I would like to welcome Donna Lopiano to introduce our next session. Donna is a Softball Hall of Fame member. She's the former first female athletic director for the University of Texas at Austin, a good friend, and part of the Women's Sports Policy Working Group. Thank you, Donna.
Thank you so much. Um, all of the uh, um, introducers, presenters today to have uh, spoken about their uh, considerable sport histories. I was fortunate enough to play, but I have to admit that I'm a, a product of um, being denied the opportunity to play. I grew up on a street with 15 boys and one other girl. And I was, you know, quite the young athlete at the age of, uh, my only dream in life was to be a pitcher for the New York Yankees. Uh, for, and for those of you who are, you know, in countries that don't understand baseball, um, I was going to be the Don Larson of, of the pitching staff at the New York Yankees. And at the age of 10, uh, I knew what the rite of passage was. I had to play Little League Baseball if I wanted to play um, you know, professional baseball. So I went out for the local Little League, uh, the Nickelodeon Little League in Stanford, Connecticut. I was drafted number one. And on, <laughs> and on, the, on the day you're drafted, you're lined up in front of um, a table with uniforms lined up. And I'm standing in line, the most exciting moment of my, my life, I'm 10, 11 years old, and I look at the uniforms that are lined up on the table and they're navy, navy blue and white. They're pinstripe. Those are Yankee colors. Um, there was a stack of hats that were real wool baseball caps, not the ones with plastic on the back that you adjust you know, at the end. Uh, you had to know your head size. And I can remember that moment thinking, my God, I've never had a real baseball hat. I have to, what, what size head do I have? When uh, a very tall father comes to stand be beside me and he holds up the Little League rule book and he turns to page 14 and in the center of uh, page 14 were four words that would change my life forever. No girls are allowed. My, my parents spent six years trying to find a team for me to play on. Um, I could not be a pitcher because the only team I could play on would be a softball team. And I was wanting to pitch right side up as opposed to upside down. Uh, but I finally got a chance to play. And I think that experience shaped my life in that from that moment on, I knew that no child could ever be told you cannot pursue pursue your dreams. Um, so I was fortunate enough to have parents who didn't believe in uh, sex role stereotypes, who tried to get me the opportunity to play. And as I got older, I became involved in this thing called Title IX. Um, and this was 55 years ago. You can tell from my gray hair that I was around from the beginning. Uh, but it was all about giving women uh, an equal chance to play and an, a chance to be equally treated. And it was with much surprise that five years ago, I had never even known of the transgender issue in women's sports. Just didn't know about it. I got a call from a mother of the, you, you remember the picture of the three Connecticut athletes and, and that court case? The, the mother called and said, you have to help my daughter. This is about equal opportunity for girls in sport. And I said, what's wrong? And she told me ab about the transgender situation in, in Connecticut. I live in Connecticut. I was right up the road from her. I knew nothing about this issue. I immediately called my friends, being not only a Title IX advocate, but uh, an LGBTQ rights advocate, called the people who had written the NCAA rule on the transgender eligibility athlete and said to Pat Griffith and Helen Carroll, who Helen was with the Center for Lesbian Rights um, in the United States, I, I said to Pat, teach me about this. I have no idea what this is. And that led my journey um, through the science that we're all learning about, right? But this was five years ago. For almost a year, I, I, I tried to speak with the, the transgender community on this issue, and they would not speak. There, there was this, and there still is this gulf. I asked allies at the National Women's Law Center, uh, allies, to say, get this meeting together. And they said, oh, yes, 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 never happened, right? Finally, 
uh, happened uh, uh, upon in this, in this space where nobody would talk and everybody's speaking about this. No one is still talking, right? Um, fell upon uh, some partners in crime who could have been the victims of fear. People named Martina Navratilova. People named uh, Nancy Hogshead Mako. Uh, you know, people named Donna Deverona. Uh, someone who's no longer with our group because of uh, wanting to be uh, an unbiased uh, uh, consultant to IFs across the world, Dorian uh, Coleman who litigated for uh, World Athletics, the Semenya case, case in the World Court. Um, uh, Tracy Sundlin, uh, the only guy we let in, who has... Uh, uh, Mariah Burton Nelson, who wrote, uh, the stronger uh, women get, the more men love football. Uh, we, and, and what was true about this group is every single one of them had been attacked in the media, had, had been attacked. And the reason we got together and said, this is as, as big as the group is going to be, is because all of our friends who were athletes had said, we cannot speak. Um, we will lose sponsorships. We will, something bad will happen. And we said, let's keep this small. And we, uh, we were the untouchables in the sense that we were too old to lose anything. Um, but yet we had the respect to, uh, to, to not have people believe that we were in it for the wrong reasons. We were champions of uh, LGBTQ rights. So it was in that five, five years ago in that space that this group started and we said, we are going to build a website and we're gonna put all the science in this place, womensportspolicy.org. Uh, and that was a three year effort to, in one place, say, here's the science, we're gonna all go back to the science. The other thing we said is we're gonna defend those uh, people who were attacked, um, you know, in the press with the truth of science. But I wanna I want say something uh, to everybody right now. When you do something like ICONS has just done, publicly, visibly, challenge the existing system of fear um, there is this thing called social media, and there's this thing called Twitter who tries to take down the leadership of people who are trying to do the right thing, and I, I just urge people, when you read something about someone who you think should be respected, you don't believe Twitter, and you don't believe what's on social media, you go to the principal and you say, what is the deal here? And we just can't, we have to support each other in all of this because we're... <laughs> so I, I'm here, even though I'm introducing you know, someone to really uh, say I, I trust that everybody here is in, in it for the long game. Title IX was all about persistence over time. Every good athlete is about persistence over time, and it's, it, it is, we're, we're good at that. We are absolutely good at that. We lose easily, easily. We, we have to go through this process of losing, uh, whether you're in New Zealand or, uh, or Australia or, or wherever you are right now, we are gonna lose, but good athletes do what? You step back, you say, why did I lose? You don't cry and take, you know, take your beer and go home. You, you go back out on the field till you win. And I can't, I, I can't say enough about allies. This is a story of allies over the last five years. Might have started with five of us. And then we got a, you know, Kim, whose daughter was right in the middle of the Leah Thomas uh, situation. Uh, a mother scorned is the strongest woman in the world. Don't, do not, do not pick on your daughter. Uh, if anyone knows the history of Title IX, the reason why we won Title IX was fathers. Fathers with daughters. There were no women in Congress <laughs> in the mid-1970s. 
Um, and so where's our, where, where's our father's club? Tracy, that's you, right? Tracy's in charge of building the, the father's club. We've got a bunch of us who are in, uh, in charge of uh, figuring out how to educate con Congress, right? But it's figuring out every step of the way, alliances and friends, commitment to truth, commitment to science, it's a long game. Um, so I hope you all, I'm, I'm really glad there's a bigger team now here than what we started with. Um, so now I'd like to um, welcome our next speaker, Colin Wright. Uh, Colin will share the basics on the biology of sex and expound on the process of determining eligibility, including screening techniques and how they can be used to help determine category eligibility in sports. Colin has a PhD in evolutionary biology from UC Santa Barbara and had expected to explore a career in science and academia. Like Professor Hooven, he was startled to discover that the academy was stifling truth for ideology when he was working as an ever research fellow at state. His response was to leave the world of academics uh, and bring attention to the threat to, uh, to science that ideology posed. He began by founding and editing the outlet Reality's Last Stand. In addition, his writing has appeared in the Wall Street Journal, The Times, The New York Post, Newsweek, uh, Quilliet, and then peer-reviewed journals. Uh, he's been a guest on the Joe Rogan Experience, Tucker, uh, Tucker Carlson uh, tonight. Tucker Carlson, jeez. Oh, um, uh, <laughs> Trigonometry uh, and Tim Cast IRL. Colin is also a Manhattan Institute Fellow and an academic advisor at the Society for Evidence-Based Gender Medicine. Uh, would you please welcome Colin? And before I say that, uh, Pamela uh, Pereski is going to uh, join him after his remarks, uh, and she's going to host a Q&A with Colin. Please welcome Colin Wright. <laughs> Hello. Can everybody hear me okay? I'm kind of tall here. So thanks for coming out. So as was said, I, I didn't come to this really from a sports background or anything like that. I was just a scientist studying bugs uh, in my laboratory. I was kind of keeping a pulse on, on the culture though and I then started to see a lot of this kind of pseudoscience bubbling up in my own departments. You know, I thought it was going to be this hermetically sealed things in the humanities. It couldn't possibly take over the, you know, my field, especially evolutionary biology. Um, but I started seeing my colleagues saying weird things about the biology of sex. They would say things like, maybe there's five sexes. Maybe there's just a continuum of sexes, you know, an infinite number. Or maybe it's just a social construct. It has nothing to do with, with reality. It's just something we construct by language. Um, so my initial, you know, I was just basically pushing back on factual things about biology. I wasn't into sports. I wasn't, at the time, into pushing back on the gender-affirming uh, care model. Um, and really, my, my, my problem was that if you're denying fundamental aspects of biology or of any major aspect of reality, it's going to have a lot of consequences. Things are going to bubble up. You're going to see the fruits of that reality denial. You know, I got into evolutionary biology uh, in large part because I was involved in sort of the creationism intelligent design debate. I thought it was important for people to understand about evolution. And then, uh, you know, that wasn't too bad because most of the people who are in evolutionary biology departments, they're on my side. I wasn't censored. I could speak fine about this stuff, uh, you know, no consequences to my career. But when they started saying stuff about biology, about, you know, the pseudoscience of sex denialism or the sex spectrum, uh, I began to speak up and instead of just getting scientific answers back in a nice academic dialogue, I was called a racist, transphobe, what have you. Uh, so that's that's a bad thing. <laughs> so uh, I'm going to be going over um, sort of the biology of sex. Uh, is that slide up there? So I think this is really important to go over um, because, you know, well, we have one side of the debate, if you want to call it a debate, really, that is just flagrantly denying biological truths. Um, but there's also things that I think our side gets wrong a lot about it, about what the sex binary actually is. And so I think we could all benefit from just sort of 
drilling down on what it means to be male and female at a really fundamental level, uh, and how that isn't just for humans, but how it uh, applies across the entire animal plant kingdom, uh, you know, biology in general. Because there's nothing particularly unique about humans about sex. We're just one of, you know, so many organisms that uh, that display this. So I'll start with. Oh, uh, also I want to comment on the title. The title of my talk was originally like. Uh, debunking the sex spectrum or why sex isn't a spectrum. But then Riley Gaines talked about, I think it was her, the NCAA head of sports or something who talked about how they're you know fully supporting Leah Thomas because of the evolving science on sex. Um, I would I would call it evolving pseudoscience on sex, but um, I'm going to be de debunking this evolving science uh, on the on this topic. So we're going to start out very basic. Hold on here. Let me just get in a presenter view for myself here. Okay, so sexual reproduction. Sexual reproduction is a type of reproduction that involves a complex life cycle in which a gamete, such as sperm or egg cell with a single set of chromosomes, combines with another to produce a zygote that develops into an organism composed of cells with two sets of chromosomes. Okay, so what that looks like in, in practice here is we have the ovary. This is in females. Uh, males have testes. They produce egg and sperm from these, uh, from these organs. These become fertilized into a zygote. These cells begin to divide into an embryo, and then eventually this will create a fully, uh, fully fleshed out <laughs> organism that will then grow up, it will uh, you know, mature, and then it will again make, restart this life cycle over again. So what are males and females? Something to do with that. <laughs> Broadly speaking, males are the sex that produce small gametes, sperm, and females produce large gametes. Really, that's the fundamental difference, is this the size of the gametes that we produce. Uh, but a lot of activists will push back on here because they'll say something like, well, prepubescent boys, they're not producing sperm actively, or postmenopausal women, they're no longer producing ova. Do we cease to become females when you know you go through menopause, or do boys become male? Like they're, no, they're not male when they're born. Um, no, that's not entirely correct, because uh, the sex of an individual is based on the reproductive anatomy and is defined by the type of gamete this anatomy is organized around through development to produce. Hold on here. Let me get to a different presenter view. So, because there is no third, one second, because there's no third or intermediate gamete, and therefore no third type of anatomy that can develop to produce it, there are only two sexes in humans, or there can only be two sexes really in, in general. Biological sex is a binary system because of this, okay? When we say sex is binary, as a biologist, we don't mean that every individual in the history of humankind can be completely unambiguously classified as either male or female. Maybe there's some cases of true ambiguity out there, but that doesn't matter. You know, the, the prevalence of ambiguity has no bearing on how many sexes there are. Um, there's only two sexes that you can be, okay? So that's, that's what we mean as biologists when we say that sex is binary. There are only two sexes. So I'm gonna be debunking some myths about the biology of sex. Uh, some of the main myths are, well, one, that sex is a spectrum. Uh, this is usually looking at sex as sort of the statistical category. We're just variations of maleness and femaleness. No one's definitively one or the other sex. Or that the idea that there are more than two sexes. Um, you know, two is like the number that we can't be. It has to be three, four, five, in, infinite number. Uh, what I would like to see, though, is, and it's important to point out, that the people who are arguing for the sex spectrum are actually fundamentally different than the people who are arguing for uh, you know, that sex is some other d definite number. And I really think we should be seeing debates between those sides, but really in reality we see the same people making arguments both for the sex spectrum, which is sort of a sex eliminationist view, and for more than two sexes, which sort of is a sex expansionist view. So there's really fundamental contradictions within their own belief system here. Uh, so I'll be going through kind of both of these, these notions. So the first is the sex spectrum, okay? Um, this is really all a major attempt to make 
sex seem more science-y, make this pseudoscience seem more like it's rooted in, 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 in physics or something here, like, you know, they, they go for this, the spectral ideas. What this really says, though, is that sex is a statistical category, okay? No one can really be 100% male or female. They really think that we're all just degrees of maleness and femaleness, um, and based on your sexual characteristics that you have, based on the way you look, uh, you might fall more to, on one side or the other, um, or if you're sort of in the middle, that's what makes you an intersex person. This is what they believe. Sometimes they try to make it appear a little more sciencey, and they'll say that, well, it's a bimodal spectrum, and so there's clustering in these two main categories that we kind of call male and female, but really it's just still a spectrum. Um, people can fall sort of in between these categories. Uh, in the middle here, it's like the little intersex valley. Um, but they never really specify what's on the x-axis. Like, this is, this is what? This is breast size? This is, who, it's, it's really not clear. Um, and we'll go into later about why this is actually a truly regressive view of biology. It really just reifies a lot of um, sort of bad stereotypes that I think we should have been getting over by now. So I used to think that, you know, this was going to be, these ideas were just sealed in these weird, you know, uh, departments in academia and they wouldn't transfer over to, to science. Um, but then I saw them begin to sort of proliferate uh, into sort of the mainstream view here. We have uh, Scientific American, they ran an article that's, you know, viewing sex as a spectrum, and they have this really complex chart. Uh, Emma Hilton has pointed out how they've actually made this unnecessarily complex, where they, they put something on one side just so they can have an arrow going all the way across the chart just to make it look like, oh, well, this is, we don't even know what's going on. We just need to throw our hands up. <laughs> who knows what sex is? Um, and they actually have individuals who are biologically male, like, on one side, closer to the female uh, side. So it just, it makes no sense. Uh, we see here the Discover magazine, uh, where they say that, you know, studies indicate uh, that uh, sex, like gender, exists along a spectrum based on looking at skeletons, apparently. Um, this is, there's plenty of YouTube videos that have millions of views about sex being a spectrum. There's entire books dedicated to the sex spectrum. Uh, the Trevor Project, New York Times, uh, Why Sex is Not Binary. And then what really got me out of the lab, <laughs> really angry, is when, when nature, nature itself, uh, the most prestigious journal in the entire world. They ran an article, uh, Sex Redefined. There's apparently a redefinition. Um, the subtitle was, The idea of sexes is simplistic. Biologists now think there is a wider spectrum than that. So this, was, this came out in 2015. So this is when I started really seeing what was going on and uh, getting quite, quite angry at the fact. Uh, and so you, but people might say, well, you know, just because these ideas are in journals, just because they've infiltrated the hard sciences, are they really having any impact in, in the real world, what, do we, what, what, is, what are the consequences of these, uh, these beliefs? Um, because beliefs, I believe, you know, they do have consequences. If you believe something truly, you're gonna act based on that, and then your actions influence others around you. Uh, and I think what we're seeing right now is sort of the, the fruits of this fundamental reality denial. Uh, we're seeing males competing in female sports. If we were just talking about gender's a spectrum, your expression is a spectrum, well, this doesn't get you males competing in female sports. This doesn't get you people who are not intersex, they're not ambiguous in any way, just competing in a category where they have no business in being. So uh, seeing this type of stuff, this is just you know, complete reality denial. There's no way to, to justify this in any way. Uh, if you have bad ideas about you know, physics and engineering, you see bridges collapsing around you in society. If you have really bad ideas about biology, you see males in female sports. You see just a complete fundamental denial of, of reality. So there's two main arguments for the sex spectrum. The first one uh, has to do with intersex conditions. And that's the first one I'll be going into. The next one has to do with secondary sex characteristics. And those are the characteristics that we, uh, that we acquire during puberty. So what, what creates the uh, uh, sexual dimorphism that we have in, in, in humans and other species. So first I'll go into the intersex arguments. So the argument here, let me catch up on my own slides here. The intersex argument is that sex cannot be binary if some individuals have sexual anatomy that appears to fall somewhere in between males and females, okay? And again, we have this chart that they try to, this is always thrown in my face on Twitter whenever I even mention this thing. Um, so this is, this is what we're up against. This is what the sex spectrum would actually look like if we were being honest. And this is actually kind of a, also not entirely correct. 
So the idea that sex is a spectrum, again, it's this, this notion that we're all statistical, uh, you know, males and females. We're not definitively male and female, it's just a statistical reality. We're more male, more female, maleness and femaleness. In reality, sex is more like you're all one or the other. Um, there's, you know, the prevalence of intersex conditions if we define it sort of as the appearance of sexual ambiguity at birth or sort of a mismatch between your internal and external sexual characteristics. We can get about 0.02%, but then again, this is also slightly misleading because when you actually look, investigate a little further with these people with intersex conditions, uh, they can almost unambiguously be classified as either male or female itself. So this is uh, just sort of to dispel the sex spectrum. What we're really talking about is these categorical variables. There are, there are these categories that almost everyone falls into unambiguously um, and, you know, we're not just degrees of male or female. So again, the sex binary just means there are only two sexes, okay? Uh, this, this, the, the prevalence of intersex conditions has no bearing whatsoever on whether this is, whether there's more than two sexes. Th if intersex conditions were half the population, if it were 50%, there would still only be two sexes. You would just have individuals who appear to be ambiguous. But ambiguous is not in itself a third sex. Um, there's this thing I like to call the intersex trap that a lot of people try to do where they try to say, they try to make the prevalence of intersex as, as prevalent as possible to try to sort of take down the sex binary. Or they'll try to do something where they'll say that, well, the existence of some people who appear somewhat ambiguous, you know, this, is, this isn't just a comment on them, but it, it's a comment on, on everybody. You know, this, this brings everyone into question. So this is Alice Drager. She's a historian of science. And she refers to intersex people as hermaphrodites. Uh, she says here that uh, hermaphroditism causes a great deal of confusion, more than one might uh, at first appreciate, because as we'll see again and again, the discovery of a hermaphroditic body raises doubts not just about the particular body in question, but about all bodies. The questioned body forces us to ask what exactly it is, if anything, that makes the rest of us unquestionable. Okay, so this is the extrapolation, maybe a small blur at a very well-defined boundary, and is trying to, you know, extrapolate it to the entire picture to make us all somewhat ambiguous. This is how you get males and female sports. If we can't draw a line here, well, we're all a little bit ambiguous. Who's to say Leah Thomas can't play in the, in the, in the female category? Because where, who gets the authority of where to draw the line? You know, we're all a little bit ambiguous. Any line you draw, I can just draw it a little bit more to the, to the left or right of that. That's sort of what they're getting at. Um, in reality, sex is more you know, like, a, like flipping a coin, really. So when you flip a coin, in this case a nickel, you, you, if you flip it just once, you don't ever get a result that's like 67% heads, okay? It's either heads or tails. You get one or the other, and there's no ambiguity about the outcome of, of your flip, okay? Uh, so that's kind of like how sex is. People are usually only, well, are, are only all male or female. But on a coin, you know, people have actually done this in, in the lab, I suppose. They've flipped a, a nickel a bunch of times, and they find out that on an like, extremely flat surface, about one in 6,000 times the coin will land on its edge. But the existence of the edge of a coin doesn't mean that heads and tails no longer exist. It doesn't mean that they're social constructs. It doesn't mean that there's, they are, there's still somehow degrees of heads and tails. Really, uh, it just means that sometimes you might get an edge, an edge flip, okay? Um, just like in humans, if you have ambiguity, that doesn't call us all into question. So this is the intersex trap. Um, you'll notice this is, uh, applies to sports a lot because um, a lot of conversations that we have about, uh, about intersex individuals, or if we're, if we're, for instance, if we're talking about Leah Thomas and we're trying to make arguments about why Leah Thomas can't, shouldn't compete in the female category, a lot of times we'll get people who bring up someone like Castor Semenya. Okay? They, they'll just start bringing up intersex individuals or various intersex traits. Um, this is sort of designed to sow confusion. They don't want to talk about Leah Thomas because Leah Thomas is not intersex. Leah Thomas is unambiguously male, and it's impossible to defend Leah Thomas competing in female sports. So what do they do? They want to go to the weird, ambiguous center. They might bring up some various intersex conditions. They'll find journal articles from the 60s or something. Like, here's some individual with one ovary and one testy. Like, what, what, where should this person play? Now, this is just, like, designed to get you on your heels, designed to just make you defensive. And the idea is if you can't just respond immediately to these 50 different uh, conditions that you've never heard of before, then, you know, oh, that's shame on you. You need to be able to, you, that's why Leah Thomas should be able to play. Um, but importantly to consider is that Leah Thomas is not intersex. 
that's a completely different thing. We shouldn't conflate these two things. So if anybody comes at you and tries to bring up Castor Semenya when you're talking about Leah Thomas, just completely reject that conversation completely because we're not talking about intersex conditions. We're talking about someone who's unambiguously 100% male trying to compete in the female category. So uh, yeah, you need to learn to just sort of move past that tactic and be able to spot the intersex trap and not let them do that. So we're gonna move on to the secondary sex characteristics now. And remember, these are characteristics that we all have during, uh, that we acquire during puberty. So males become taller, their jaws get more well-defined, their voice deepens, females will grow breast. Uh, we have different ways, fats distributed all over our bodies. These are the, you know, the things we might socially identify with you know, your male and female friends and how we might identify someone as male or female because you know, we're all wearing clothes. We just kind of see our secondary sex characteristics. Uh, this is really persuasive to a lot of people because, again, it's like the everyday way that we go about sort of identifying people's sex. We're not doing genital exams on everybody, at least I sort of hope we're not. Uh, so the argument here, oh, sorry. Um, so this is actually the gender-bred person. You've probably all seen this. This is an extremely common educational tool, I mean, uh, indoctrination uh, tool for kids. Um, I've even seen this in college courses. Like, super belittling. Um, but let's see how they're defining biological sex uh, according to, to this diagram. And this isn't just this diagram. You'll see this in scientific articles too because uh, they just keep running away with it. Um, so if you zero in on the area where it says biological sex, they define sex. Let me pull it up so I can see it. Uh, the physical sex characteristics you're born with and develop, including genitalia, body shape, voice pitch, body hair, hormones, chromosomes, etc. Body shape, <laughs> voice pitch, <laughs> body hair. I mean, the implication of this is that a woman who with particular, if you're not, you don't shave your legs or you're particularly hairy legs, you're actually more male by, by, by the sheer fact of that. If you're a boy who has a higher voice, you're actually more female. Okay, this is, this is the consequence of this sort of sex as a, a composite trait, you know, it's, there's several characteristics and we just statistically make up either males or females if you have enough male leaning traits versus female leaning ones, okay? And this is just a fundamental misunderstanding of what it means to be biologically male or female. Uh, as I mentioned, they'll sometimes say sex is bimodal to make things sound more sciencey. Um, the secondary sex characteristics argument gives rise to this sort of bimodal spectrum claim. And if you're talking about any specific characteristic, like height, for instance, yeah, we are, we are bimodal, but your height doesn't determine your sex. And if we're talking about body weight, yeah, that's kind of bimodal too. With regard to any other trait with secondary sex characteristics, there's variation between males and females. We're gonna see overlap in them. Sometimes they conform to a bimodal spectrum. Um, but that's not what it means for sex to be bimodal itself. You know, uh, I'll get into this in just a little bit. But this is just confusing, again, traits that are either a consequence of your sex or traits that uh, are mechanisms that give rise to your sex with sex itself. So science-based medicine, <laughs> the, Steve Novella, he had an article where he argued that uh, sex was bimodal. He used this diagram in it, so a similar one. Um, again, this is just a complete misunderstanding. People, again, they never specify what the x-axis is or even the y-axis, I guess it's frequency, but you know, Anytime they, if they were to actually put words to this, it would just reveal immediately how completely regressive like, these ideas are. Nevertheless, he says that uh, the notion that sex is not strictly binary, it's not even scientifically controversial. Among experts, it's a given, an unavoidable conclusion derived from actually understanding the biology of sex. It's more accurate to describe biolog biological sex in humans as bimodal, but not strictly binary. Um, and later in the article, he, again, just makes these fundamental, he's basically just arguing for the gender-bred person type stuff, that there's all these sex-related characteristics, and look how, look at the variation in those things. So I'll show you how regressive this idea is when we actually put variables <laughs> on this uh, bimodal spectrum here. So uh, imagine these are individuals, A, B, C, and D. Um, let's look at individuals C and D. These are, I guess, what they would call statistical females or something. But what does it mean for individual D here? What, what are we measuring on the x-axis? Is this maybe breast size or something? So are we seeing that female D is more of a female because they have much larger breasts than, uh, than female C? Or if we're looking at male side, if one has a, a higher pitched voice, if we're looking at, if, vo if this is voice pitch, you're more male because you have you know, a, high, uh, a lower voice than you do 
um, to another male. This is, I, I kind of refer to this as like the playground bully logic that, that I think we should have, or we're trying to get past. Um, you know, I've seen bullies when I was a kid, and if you have a boy who's really effeminate, has a high-pitched voice, maybe just has, you know, facial hair is not coming in, in high school is having a really hard time, they'll get bullied, you know, maybe they say like, what are you, a girl? You have all these traits that are very feminine. But if this person were to then go complain to the principal or something, and to, you know, that they're being bullied, the principal might like bring out their sex spectrum chart and be like, well, <laughs> maybe you are actually a girl. <laughs> so, yeah, so th this is just why, it, it, it's, it's the aggressive nature of this stuff that really, really gets me. Um, so any competent biologist, I think, when they see a, a bimodal spectrum, if they're looking at a population, let's say you're studying like meadow voles or something, uh, and you see that you're looking at body weight, and you see something like a, a bimodal spectrum, the first thing that should pop into your head is, I'm studying two populations here. You know, it's one population of meadow voles, but there's like a subpopulation, going. there's something going on here. And if you know anything about biology, you know that male and females are a thing in mammals, and you probably <laughs> think that, oh, maybe this is just the, their sexual dimorphism. This is what it means to be sexual dimorphic with respect to any trait. Uh, and so when you actually look under the hood of the bimodal spectrum uh, with regard to, so let's I think this is height in humans, you'll see something like this. You'll see that going from left to right, it's not that you're, you're somewhat of a woman here and you become more male as you, get, as you get taller. It's that the proportion of males and females changes as you go from left to right because you know, there's overlap between males and females and how tall they are or in any other trait you want to measure that's related to sex. There's a new paper the evolving science uh, that has it doesn't even like the bimodal thing anymore. That's outdated. That's so 2022. Um, they want to say that sex is multimodal now. You know, it's uh, it's it's composed of. Let me see here. They have they wrote it out. Uh, sex is often used to describe a suite of phenotypic and genotypic traits. That's actually. I mean, it is often described that way by people who don't know anything about the actual biology. So, um, and they kind of just cite themselves a lot because you'll get a paper like this where they'll talk about sex being this composite trait of all these other things, and then another paper will then sort of idea launder that and be like, sometimes sex is described as your chromosomes, your hormones, how tall you are, all that stuff. Um, but they argue, you know, not all these traits, gamete type, chromosomal, inheritance, physiology, morphology, behavior, uh, not all of them are necessarily linked. Uh, and the rhetorical collapse of variation into a single term, male or female, uh, elides much of the complexity inherent in reproductive phenotypes. But no biologist thinks that there isn't an amazing diversity of the ways that different species go about bringing egg and sperm together. There's, the ecology matters a lot, uh, you know, the evolutionary inertia from what you've been before. I mean, there's plenty of ways that nature has solved these mechanisms. I mean, seahorses, you probably hear this all the time. Uh, you know, their males are the ones that carry the offspring. They, they give birth. But we know that they're males because they have uh, they're the ones that produce the small gametes. You know, this is how we can even identify these anomalies is if we first understand what sex is, is, is separate from whether you're giving birth, it's separate from your hormones, it's separate from how tall you are, etc. Uh, this is an actual figure from that paper, by the way. Um, <laughs> so the outdated on the left here, that's the, the A is the sex binary, that's just, that's right out, that's no longer good. The sex uh, bimodal spectrum, which was uh, in vogue until very recently. And now this is what they're going for. This is, this is just, you know, measuring like a, 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 a bramble patch and trying to like understand something about the, the you know, how, how complex it is or getting fundamental truths at it just by taking all these crazy measurements when they don't understand that there's like a fundamental reason that combines like all these different things we see in nature, all the variation. And that's because there's males and females that gives rise to these you know, regularities in nature and also helps explain the anomalies that we see when, when this isn't the case. And there's usually a good reason why we see a quote unquote sex reversal in roles or something in nature. It's because of, uh, you know, their, their life history. Something about it is indicative of why, why they don't do it the same way. Um, this idea that sex is like a composite trait, this is, this is very relevant in sport, but it's also relevant in the sort of the gender affirming care type of stuff. Um, and it's, it's rooted in two different notions. Um, I'll bring it back to sport in just one second here, but um, basically the sex spectrum, they believe, you know, this is rooted in, uh, rooted in anatomy, they believe it's fundamentally mutable. You know, you can just change your secondary sex characteristics and you can literally change your sex, okay? 
you remove a, a woman's breast, she becomes more male. Uh, and the other half of this is this idea that uh, you, there's this brain sex notion, um, that your gender identity is something that is inherent in you, it's knowable from a very young age, and it's completely immutable. It can't be changed ever. So the idea, at least in the gender affirming care stuff, is that, well, let's measure a person's sex characteristics. Maybe you look quite feminine in your, in your characteristics, so you, maybe you're a, uh, you know, a two and a half here and towards the female side of the spectrum. Let's say you're quite tomboyish, and so you may be over here. And according to this model, you have this mismatch between your gender identity and the sex that you were assigned at birth, as they would say. Um, but no fear, because we can uh, just perform some surgeries and we can literally just sort of make those into alignment. Because again, sex is this mutable thing. Just remove your breasts, boom. Uh, this is what's done in sports to some degree where you know, we see this idea that before you needed to have genital surgery to be co compete in the female category you know, because you know, we're just gonna change your characteristics. Now you're all of a sudden a woman. Um, then it became a hormone level. So you know, this idea that we can change someone's sex just by changing these secondary sex characteristics or these sex-related traits, uh, this is all sort of fundamentally linked. So um, yeah, I think that's an important part of this whole thing of the sex spectrum, how they think it's just completely mutable. And this gives us the justification in terms of you know, the gender-affirming care to intervene because we can actually change an individual's sex. That's actually not true. Let me go back here. So the other idea is that there's more than two sexes. Um, we see and Fausto Sterling. So for biologically speaking, there are many gradations running from female to male. Along that spectrum lie at least five sexes, and perhaps even more. <laughs> yeah, she wrote these in like the New York Times. She had articles about these. She since said that maybe she was being tongue in cheek about this, and when I called her out on Twitter that. She should inform the legions of people in my DMs that are telling me that there's five sexes. Uh, she just kind of scolded me and you know, imputed my motives or something. So uh, yeah, we'd like to hold her feet to the fire on that claim because it's, it's done quite a bit of damage. Um, this idea that there's more than two sexes, you know, popular videos, again, this has like a fundamental uh, difference here because they say biological sex is a spectrum, which is a kind of a sex eliminationist idea. And then they have here, well, there are more than two. So those are fundamentally in opposition. Um, we'll see people like this. You know, this is just someone I found on Twitter. <laughs> the Dr. Shay uh, McLean, BA, BA, MA, MA, PhD, super credentialed. Uh, hi, I'm a transgender biologist, specifically an evolutionary geneticist who studies humans. In humans, there are six common sex karyotypes. And this is in response to my friend Zach, who's talking about you know, why there's only two sexes. Um, this person then brings up chromosomes. Like, oh no, there's so many different ways that chromosomes can be arranged in human bodies. Those each correspond to a, a new sex, apparently. So if we want to take this person seriously about what they're saying, um, you know, there's actually way more than just like six ways chromosomes can be organized in bodies. There's, there's papers out there with people who are, you know, X, 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 Y, you know, you have all these different variations. Um, and so, according to this person, I guess there would be at least 11 sexes in humans. Um, seems interesting. But when we actually like look at what sex is, where it's, it's a type of reproductive strategy, it's a phenotype rooted in the types of gametes we produce, uh, we quickly see that that doesn't really hold up. You know, this is just variation within sexes. Um, you know, males can have, as long as they have a Y chromosome with an active like SRY gene, they're gonna be male. You can just add as many X chromosomes on the end of that if you want to. Still, still 100% male. Uh, and so when we actually go back and sort of look at what those sexes are, we see that this is what they correspond to. Um, this actually comes from a fundamental, like this idea that your sex chromosome uh, composition is what your sex is, uh, I think actually causes a lot of confusion, both on, well, the, the gender activist side, but also a lot of confusion on, on our side. I'll often see people say that no, sex is binary, it's XX and XY, that's the end of it. And it's kind of a compelling thing, it seems like it's very final, it seems like it's rooted in, in science. Um, but I'll, I'll get to why there's an alligator on there in a second. Um, <laughs> there's a fundamental difference between how sex is determined and how sex is defined. Okay, so, so when you say that human sex is determined by chromosomes, we're not saying it's defined by chromosomes. When biologists say that sex is determined, we're talking about what are called you know, sex determination mechanisms. This is just describing the mechanisms, genetic mechanisms, the processes that 
set an individual down a developmental pathway that will result in their being a male or female at a later point in time. So in humans, in other mammals, we have chromosomal sex determination, meaning that genes on chromosomes, uh, particularly on the Y chromosome, are what causes an individual to become male, and without that, you develop down the female pathway. Now, you can have instances where you have an XX male. If the gene that's normally on the Y chromosome becomes transposed and is put on an X chromosome, there are cases where you can have a male develop who has XX chromosomes. Okay, this is because uh, they have that gene that makes them develop into a male. So your chromosomes determine your sex, but they don't define your sex. In alligators, which is why it's up there, uh, they have what's called uh, temperature-dependent sex determination, where whether they develop into a male or a female is dependent on the temperature that they were incubated. Okay, and I studied ants, bees, and wasps when I was in graduate school uh, and as a postdoc. They have haploid diploid sex determination. It has how many doses of a certain gene do they have that determines what sex they are. Uh, but you'll notice that even though nature has a wide variety of sex determination mechanisms of different processes that lead individuals to, to become male or female, sex is still defined the same way across all of these species, which is the type of uh, gamete their reproductive system is organized around to produce. So we need to disentangle how sex is determined with how it's defined. Determination mechanisms are incredibly diverse. Definitions, there's only one. So why does this matter? So I think it matters a lot. I, I initially got you know, upset because of public trust in science. Um, you see a lot of people, uh, biologists out there who are saying that sex is a spectrum, it's a social construct. This is stuff that everyone can just see as a plain lie. Okay, we have eyes, we know that males and females are real. Um, and so if we're gonna trust them, if, we're, if we see them blatantly lying or just misleading the public uh, for political reasons on this easy stuff, like the easiest low-hanging fruit things that a scientist should be able to get right, uh, you know, we can't trust them on the much, much more complex things. Like if the same scientist says that sex is a social construct in one sentence and then their next breath they say that, uh, you know, something about climate change or something about epidemiology and, you know, the pandemic and all that stuff, you know, it's, is this, how do we trust them when we see that they're so wrong on these blatantly obvious points? Um, and then there's also, you know, sex matters in some contexts. We're sexually dimorphic. You know, there's different selection pressures between males and females that have led in our species males to be much larger, bigger, faster, stronger, and behave in different ways that can put women at risk in certain environments. So this is why we need to have, you know, sex segregated spaces in some areas. In most contexts, sex probably shouldn't matter if you're getting hired for a job, if you're getting a promotion. You know, it's only in really specific contexts that it really does matter, but it, some, in some contexts, it matters a lot such as women's sports and women's protected spaces. Um, you know, and then, you know, I kind of bring it back to the gender affirming care stuff. This is, it confuses children about what their sex is, about what, you know, their relationship between their minds and their bodies. And we're literally performing operations on kids who um, have gender dysphoria. You know, I, I would say we're giving them the gender dysphoria because otherwise we could just say, oh, you're a tomboy, you're fine, nothing's wrong with you. Uh, but now we're saying there's this fundamental mismatch between your gender identity and your body, but we can fix this through, through surgeries. Um, truth matters, I think as a scientist, just there's an inherent value in the truth. You know, we, we don't know when it's gonna become useful, uh, but it usually is. Sometimes scientists discover things, they don't know what use it's gonna be in the future, then it becomes some fundamental aspect of physics or something. Um, and just knowing what's true is just a good thing. If our actions are predicated on what we believe, it's good to have our beliefs rooted in factual things so we're not affecting others around us in ways that is not justified. So um, I'm gonna briefly kind of go over some sex testing in sports, it's, it's gonna be very brief. Um, so I think it's important to point out <laughs> here that um, back in the day, it was the male category that was the protected space. That's just because there weren't any females in sports. They weren't allowed in the first place. And there were no, there was no ambiguity in who who they were kicking out. You know, there wasn't this idea of what is a woman back then. They seemed to know pretty well which ones to <laughs> exclude from, from sports when they weren't allowed to compete at all. Uh, but, you know, and around 1900 is when they allowed some women to start competing in sports uh, and some, in some womanly games, I guess, that aren't too stressful for their dainty bodies or something. Um, so tennis and some, some golf. Uh, you know, but as, as women became more prevalent, I guess, in sports, 
uh, playing internationally, the stakes become raised, there's some more value uh, in, in making sure to, to protect against fraud. We saw what happened in like the Soviet Union and the East Germany, uh, basically just rampant doping to, to make them win. Um, and they would give these uh, people, they, they started doing these gender certificates, these proofs of femininity, I guess, if you will. But these weren't really regulated. It was just given by like your family doctor that would they'd give these things out. Um, there's not like a rigorous process, or I guess it was, at least it wasn't a normalized process. So I mean, it, it could be given to like some super feminine guy, I suppose. Uh, we moved past that. Um, you know, there were, then we're looking at, let's maybe just do genital observations. Uh, the sort of the nude parades uh, that were known to occur, which is just very demeaning. You have to just fully undress. Someone's inspecting your genitals. This isn't something that maybe people should be exposed to, given you know we have much better methods of doing that nowadays. Um, so we moved beyond that because you know some people have ambiguous-looking genitalia, and they're still they're still women, and um, they shouldn't be excluded based on on those things. Uh, so there's this idea of, of bar body testing. It's sort of basically looking at sex chromosomes. Um, because you know females have XX chromosomes in humans, in order to avoid having a double dose of, of uh, the gene products that come from the X chromosome, one is sort of becomes deactivated and it's becomes sort of fused to the side of the cells over here. Um, and so these are what we call bar bodies. And so this is one way you can detect uh, sex chromosomes. This is what we do when we do like a uh, this is the swab test. You know your cheek cells. Um, we can determine, you know, what your chromosomal makeup is. But remember that your chromosomes determine your sex. They don't quite define it. And so there's, there's maybe some instances that this test doesn't completely safeguard against. Um, females with Turner syndrome, if they don't have two X chromosomes, you know, that's, they're not going to show up on there. They're going to be, uh, you might think that they're, they're male based on just the bar body test. Um, men with Kleinfelter, they have two X chromosomes. And so they're, they're going to have a bar body. Uh, so this idea, if we're just basing it on just this test, then you know we're going to get males and female sports essentially. Um, and then CAIS individuals, this is complete androgen insensitivity. Um, most people are, seem to be okay with them competing in female sports, just because their bodies are completely uh, non-receptive to testosterone. They're born with total female appearing bodies, um, and there's no indication that there actually is any any advantage in sports with this with this class. So. Uh, but again, they will show up on the on the swab as as not being female. If this is what you're basing it on, uh, we can get more fundamental and actually look at the SRY gene, um, which is you know the the sort of master switch that makes uh, turns an embryo down in development in, into creating a, few, a male a male body. So this would be a more direct test to see if they have an active SRY gene. It's hard to imagine scenarios where this wouldn't result in a in a male. Um, and again, this is going to flag CAIS individuals, which again, most people seem to be fine with, and I, I'm fine with. Um, and then individuals with 5ARD, this is the, what Castro Semenya has. So this is a pretty good way to go about sex testing because it's going to flag individuals that you can then do a further assessment. Um, you know, we've been looking in, you know, we've had some DM exchanges with Ross Tucker about sort of the best ways to, to go about this. Um, and it might not be the best way to call it sort of sex testing in sports, but maybe moving towards this idea of sort of eligibility criteria. Um, there's costs that are involved with doing all these types of testing. We're going to test every single person who enters sports. We're going to test them when, when they're adults. After the fact, you know, there's embarrassing things that can result in there. We're going to strip people's medals away. Um, you know, one idea would be to test everyone at birth. And there's, there's good reasons to do it with SRY genes because it can identify any intersex characteristics they might have if they're not developing according to the fact that they have an active SRY gene, it's probably a good thing to know. Um, but really, if we just go back to like that bar body test, if we talk about eligibility criteria and do like a first screening, a first filter for individuals, the bar body test is going to just, it's well, one, it's going to get rid of any person who's unambiguously ma uh, male who's trying to compete in female sports. So it just throws the whole trans question right out the window. It's going to protect against all of that. Um, and then, you know, once we have this first filter, I think it makes sense to sort of then go to, you know, a private secondary follow-up assessments uh, based on, you know, the criteria that people want to set up if it's a SRY test later on. Uh, these things make sense. And this is, an essentially, this is essentially a way to just make it perfect of who is eligible to compete in, in, uh, in female sports. Um, even if we didn't have, we didn't want to use one single test, you know, there's this idea you've probably heard of don't let the you know, the perfect be the enemy of the good. 
Well, in this situation, we have these ways to evaluate people's sex that is not just good. It's like almost perfect. And so it's just that like you can't let the perfect be the enemy of the almost perfect uh, because it's, it, it, what's the alternative? I mean, the people we're arguing against, they don't have an alternative. They don't, it's not like they have this other way that is completely uh, unambiguously classifying individuals. I mean, it's unambiguously classifying them based on their subjective gender identity, but that's just the Wild West that doesn't control for any, for sex whatsoever. Um, it's the least rigorous thing imaginable if you're uh, to base classifying sex on. So they don't actually have an alternative. Uh, so, you know, almost perfect is it's pretty good. <laughs> and uh, I think we should probably stick to, stick to that as, as much as possible. So that's <laughs> my talk. Thank you. Okay, well, a lot to um, unpack, and I'm sure everybody has a lot of questions, but I'm just gonna start off by um, uh, asking you to talk a little more about uh, something that struck me uh, when you were talking about the redefinition of sex in that, uh, that article. Um, it reminded me of, um, I think it was two days ago at this point, um, how changing the definitions of words changes the law. Um, uh, and it made me see how changing the definitions of words also changes our understanding of biology. Um, and, and it also reminded me of something that Carol uh, taught me, which is I had been using the phrase biological sex and um, she said, you know, that's re redundant. And, um, and it also leads to the impression that there's another kind. So I stopped using that phrase, I now just say sex. Um, but, um, but that also uh, leads me to the, the fact that we are now seeing in medical and biological journals the term assigned sex at birth. And um, your presentation really talked about, um, in part, some of the reasons we have that term, right? We have that term because there are some people, a very small percentage of the population, who have been assigned a sex inaccurately, like Castor Semenya, right? Castor Semenya was assigned female at birth. But Castor Semenya is male, right? And you had that slide up, Leah Thomas is not intersex. Castor Semenya is also male, though, right? Can you talk a little bit about that? Yeah, I mean, so from a, a biological point of view, Castor Semenya is clearly biologically male. Um, people with Castor's condition have fathered offspring before. Uh, so there's no am ambiguity there. There was only ambiguity at birth, really, because the condition that Castor has can lead to you know, uh, either feminine appearing or ambiguous genitalia uh, at birth. So in a certain country, sometimes if they don't have as rigorous a screening, we can see uh, that this is often missed. In the US, it's not really much of an issue because there's plenty of like prenatal screening that goes on um, that catches a lot of these uh, intersex conditions before they reach adulthood and before they're competing as females in, in certain sports. So it's, it's, you know, it's not Castor Semenya's fault, the fact that you know, Castor was, was uh, allowed to compete in the sports, but it's still, it's still not fair and it's, it's unfortunate that you know, you'd have to go in there and say that sorry, you're not allowed to compete in this category. Um, the sex assigned at birth terminology, you know, it's, it's often conflated with gender assigned at birth too, because, and they'll go back and forth between these two things. Um, if you go on the Planned Parenthood website, it'll talk about, well, why do we say, and it'll say sex or gender assigned at birth, and it says, well, because that's the doctor making a choice for somebody that they had no say in. Um, because there, there's, there's this idea that Doctors are assigning genders, you know, like social roles and expectations at birth. But a doctor, they're not assigning masculinity or femininity to a, a child. They're not saying, you know, it's, it's not like the godfather is like, you will have a masculine child. It's, <laughs> it's, they're just literally looking at the reproductive organs, which is like an incredibly reliable proxy for their biological sex. And they're just recording this and that's all there is to it. Um, they're not assigning a gender. Uh, they're not assigning a sex. 
Um, and in instances where they, there is a mistake, I mean, that can just be followed up later on. This idea that, again, it's part of like the Alice Drager quote where if we can find some individuals who were wrongly assigned, then we're all sort of ambiguous. We're all maybe have been assigned correctly. We don't quite know, but we're all in this like state of limbo uh, until, until further notice, you know, but that's, that's not really the case. Uh, most of us, I think, are pretty much uh, were, were observed and recorded correctly. So let's um, go to questions. Um, where's the mic? Coming. Here comes the mic. We're going to have to make this pretty quick because yeah. lunch is only an hour today. So we'll just take maybe three questions okay. and go. Okay. Uh, great. Um, hi. I was wondering what your thoughts on, are on why do you think it is that um, scientists and medical people who one thinks of as very literal minded and fact based. Why why have they gone down this road? What's what's the motivation? It's hard to know for sure. I can speak to some of the people in my departments um, and what I hear from you know academics reaching out to me and it's it can be career suicide to to push back against this stuff. Psychologists, doctors don't want to have their licenses revoked. Um, if you were in my position, I was uh, I was a postdoc at Penn State, non tenured. Uh, when I started talking about this stuff, they swarmed hard. The activists went ballistic. You know, they lost their minds trying to, they called universities I was applying to jobs for. They posted on job boards that don't hire this guy. He's a racist, race scientist, big, big at homophobe. Um, you know, they, they went completely crazy because they know that they can sort of just tarnish your name as much as possible to get you kicked out. It's, it's both, yeah. I think, I mean... Well, because the, a lot of them know that they can just swarm in a mob and get people to either repent or shut up. They see what happens to someone like me, um, and then you know that makes other scientists who are in the area, they're just like, well, I'm not touching that with a 20-foot pole. Like, why would I subject myself to this uh, crazy struggle session and potentially lose a career that I've been, you know, I went to grad school for five years to get a PhD. Okay. I was an undergrad before that. We um, need to take some more questions, but while we're waiting yeah. for the mic to go to somebody, uh, there's a hand over here, um, that um, uh, I just want to address this thing about why people don't speak up. That is something that we were talking about on the other panel, too, and it happens across topics. It's because all it takes is for you to see one person like Colin or like Carol and how they are treated, and then the assumption is if you speak up, that's how you'll be treated. But the truth is that's not what always happens. And the detractors say, cancel culture doesn't exist, see how many people don't get canceled, right? But it, the fear is the culture. Cancel culture is fear culture. And it takes a lot to overcome the fear. Great point. The one uh, condition that I find confounding is ovo testes, and, and it seems like that would, I haven't actually heard of, of ovo testes conditions, like, you know, making big news like, like Castor Semenya's condition. So most of those people are female, but they're producing a lot of testosterone. So uh, how, would, how would that fit in with the elig eligibility? Since I know two people with ovo testes. Yeah, I mean, so ultimately, there hasn't been any individual that has been able to produce both sperm and ova at the same time. Um, so usually we can see that there's sort of a, a bias towards, towards one or the other. If they're completely sterile, it's a little more difficult because they're not producing one or the other. Um, but usually if, they have, if they're like XX chromosomes, we can see where they were sort of, their, their body was developing, then it could have uh, other structures that are, that are very, uh, that are female structures uh, as well. Um, but it does get, I mean, I think that I always leave open the possibility that there's going to be some individual who can be truly ambiguous with respect to sex that could really puzzle people. Like, that's, that's a possibility. At least I leave the door open for that. Um, but again, this wouldn't be an individual who's a third sex. And then I think in terms of sports, you know, this is something we need to leave up to the governing bodies to, to decide how they want to, what criteria they want for, for these individuals. So I think it's at least theoretically possible for someone to not have a sex. Uh, and so that might be something that we need to have a, you know, a policy for. Do, do yeah, we have time for one more question? One more, Kim? Quick, yeah, sure. All right, you, you have to pick. Okay, 
I, I'm sorry. <laughs> <laughs> Um, this is a comment on, you said Castor Semenya, it's not really his fault. And I would disagree. There's plenty of evidence now that he knows he's a male and he's still competing against women. Now, I'm not saying anything about this. I'm saying it's a social issue that's a huge issue that people cannot accept responsibility for choices they've made or mistakes that have been made when there's a clear correction to that and they refuse to acknowledge it. I'm furious. Do we yeah, have time for just one quick more? And Yeah. There you go. Hi. Um, so I just graduated in the spring with my bachelor's in biology and philosophy. And that that um, paper that the Science Direct thing was handed to me in my genetics class. And I'm just wondering how we're, how can we get this misinformation out of like my undergraduate institution, which is like highly regarded. I'm not going to name them just because I don't want to, you know, <laughs> but um, like I, how are we, like, if I'm going through getting my degree in biology, let's say I go to grad school and I have this as my building block, how are we getting this misinformation, like, out of this system? How are we getting all the skewed information from getting to, like, undergraduate institutions, graduate institutions? Like, how are we getting this out of here? Yeah, I, I, I don't know how. I don't know if it's possible, except for just trying to expose it as much as, as we can. I mean, that, that article, it's not published in a journal yet. It's on, a, it's like a preprint. And so I went ahead and gave it the review it deserved. You know, I pre-bunked it. <laughs> <laughs> so uh, I, I wrote a, a short version of it for City Journal, and I wrote like a, a 6,000 word just full of review of that entire paper uh, on my sub stack. And so, you know, it, it was a popular article. So hopefully, if any reviewers are reviewing it right now, they'll they'll see that, or maybe they'll ask me to review it. That'd be fun. Um, but really, it's just we just got to keep calling it out and exposing it. Um, I, I'm not too optimistic about universities at this moment, um, but I mean, you just got to keep keep calling it out as much as you can. Unfortunately, more and more people can call it out now. That's a little safer than when I first started writing about this stuff in like 2018. So, um, yeah, it, just keep. Keep doing it. Keep so before we go to lunch, I just want to say that it is Helen Joyce's birthday today. So maybe as we're all getting ready to go to lunch, we can stand up and sing happy birthday to Helen. <laughs> hey, and Thank before you. we do that, I just lunch is one hour. It's outside. We're going to have a very interesting discussion. I'm going to give everyone a half an hour to get their lunch. Please come up and sit as close as you can to the stage. We're gonna have just a quick lunchtime discussion with Sharon Davies at the end, and I hope it's just a fun conversation. Um, and then we will go on to our two quick afternoon sessions and then we adjourn. So, okay, happy ready? birthday. Happy birthday to you. Yay! Hi. I don't know if you can hear me. Hello. Can you hear me? Okay. Um, my name is Peyton McNabb. I just recently graduated from Hawassi Dam High School in Murphy, North Carolina, and I'm also a spokeswoman for Independent Women's Forum. <laughs> <Thank> <laughs> On September 1st, 2022, I was struck in the head by a spiked ball during a high school volleyball game by a biological male on the opposing team. As a result of the sheer impact of the ball, I received a concussion and a neck injury. I love sports, the camaraderie, discipline, the team bonding, and the confidence for the future. I was a three-sport athlete in high school, participating in softball, basketball, and volleyball. So given that, I was always very aware of the possibility of injury during competitive play. But my experience on the court that day was different. The ball was so violent that I was knocked unconscious, lying in a fencing position for over 30 seconds. If you're unfamiliar with the, firm, or with the term fencing, um, it also is referred to as posturing, which is a reaction to the body from a brain or a traumatic brain injury. 
Almost 11 months later, my body and mind are still recovering from the hit. I still suffer from partial paralysis on my right side, vision problems, cognitive issues, constant headaches, and more. This incident was 100% avoidable if only my rights as a female athlete had not been excluded on the basis of being inclusive to allow a biological male who self-identifies as a female to compete with women. I nor my teammates ever agreed to play against a male athlete. We were forced to by our state athletic association. If the adults in the room don't start standing up and putting an end to the senseless threat to females, there won't be women's sports. Women have a right to a fair, equal opportunity on and off the playing field. Men have no place in our single sex spaces. I love being an athlete, as do the other girls I play with and a lot of the ladies here with me today. And I'm standing here today, not only to represent myself, but to ensure all female athletes, my little sister, my cousins, my teammates, and every biological female athlete behind me has access to fair competition. Women deserve to compete on a level playing field without fear of injury. And like I've said many times, I may be the first to come before you with an injury, but I can ensure you if this does not, if this does not have a past, then I will not be the last. Um, thank you so much. And it is now my honor to introduce our next panel who will explore two, who will explore two vital topics for the U.S. Biden administration's rewrite of Title IX, equating sex to gender identity and state legislation protecting women's sports. This is important to me because had the laws protected girls like me in sports, I would not have faced injuries I'm still recovering from. First, I'd like to introduce Dr. Liz Fedek, who serves as board secretary for the Women's Liberation Front, also known as WOLF. Liz has her PhD in mathematics. <laughs> she is expected to continue in, she expected to continue inventing new methods to analyze complex systems and working in oncology labs. But, sorry, but these plans changed after Liz was harassed by a male colleague with autogenophilia. She is a survivor of childhood sexual assault and is committed to defending the rights of women and girls into helping other women heal. <laughs> Next, Doreen Denny. Senior Advisor for Concerned Women for America. Concerned Women for America, with Doreen's guidance, has launched official complaints against NCAA institutions for violating Title IX under the guise of gender identity, and she is the key part to the development of state legislation to protect women's sports and spaces. Doreen has broad experience in policy, strategy, and communication roles across the federal government in the White House, U.S. Departments of Education, Health, Human Services, and both Chambers of Congress. Joining Doreen and Liz is Nancy Hogshead, a three-time Olympic gold medalist, lawyer, the CEO of Champion Women, and representative of both the Women's Sports Policy Working Group and the International Consortium of Female Sport. Nancy has spent a lifetime fighting for civil rights, Title IX, and women's rights. So thank you so much. Thank you to Icons for allowing me to come and speak today. helping to moderate. <laughs> um, Nancy is going to get us started, um, giving us some good background on Title IX, and I mean, this has been her life's work pretty much. So she's going to give lay the foundation for us, and we'll um, go from there. Okay. Hey, everybody. So first, um, you can applaud. 
<laughs> so, yeah, um, I'll do it. Um, no, I just want to take the introductory moments here to really thank Kim and Marshy for getting us all together here and having this amazing conference. Glad you came. Yeah. <laughs> We all have our gifts, and there's no way I could put on something like this. So really, I just can't thank you enough, yeah. Um, okay, well, um, so I listened to what I had said last year about you know Title IX and athletics and whatnot, but before we get into the specifics, I just wanna emphasize how important it is that sports wins this one, because everything else follows. If we can't win on sport, then women's other private places, then women's prisons, women's dressing rooms, women's uh, intimate care, we don't stand a chance. Yep. Our strongest argument is sports. The biological differences are obvious for everyone. So this fight that we're all in is crucial for women broadly, not just competition. Can I follow up with that? I don't know if Lauren Bondley is still here, but I want to reiterate what Nancy just said. She said it so beautifully. If women cannot be af afforded the right to be treated fairly in the one place where fairness is supposed to be ensured and upheld, what hope do they have everywhere else where they are less visible? And we are told it is just our place to take this kind of discriminatory treatment. So we absolutely, in the public arena of sport, are fighting not only for ourselves and our daughters, but for all the women in the darker corners of society who are not visible. We all deserve fairness and respect. Okay, I hope that many of you, um, that this is gonna be old news for a lot of you, that you already know Title IX law specifically as it applies to athletics. Um, I brought up this one picture because it seems to be everybody's favorite. Um, I weighed 162 pounds. My biggest competitor was Tracy Calkins, who only weighed 132. She was 22% body fat. I was only 11% body fat. She couldn't lose any weight. I couldn't lose any weight. Um, we both, like, I just, you know, the, the, the way that we body shame women and the way that we, uh, if somebody doesn't conform to gender stereotypes, and, it, you know, the one thing I just love about sports overall is that it gives women a place to really be themselves and really be able to live their full lives. Um, and I, I also, you know, Sharon's in the room and other people are in the room, and I just want to make it very clear that if the East Germans had come in 1984, you would not be looking at an Olympic champion. And just think, like, well, how, what it means when I get introduced that way, uh, you know, moving through life, um, and just sort of by luck, they didn't announce that they were going to be withdrawing until just a couple of months right before the 1984 Olympics. So, you know, Sharon is an Olympic champion. Sharon absolutely was competing against other cheaters. And um, I look at this battle as being very similar. Um, okay. <clears throat> okay, so Donald Lopiano taught me 35 years ago to say this over and over again because people always wanted to know why is it that we sex segregate sport when we don't segregate the classroom or so many other areas of life. When we talk about race discrimination, we've all heard separate but equal is bad. But that is what we have in sport. Well, why do we have it in sport? And so literally for 35, 40 years, women's sports advocates have been trained and we say over and over again that in order to give girls and women equal opportunities in sports, they need their own team. In order to give girls and women, so you can practice this, in order to give girls and women equal opportunities in sports, they need their own team. Okay. So equality requires sex segregation. 
Equality requires sex segregation, okay? One of the, so I, I run Champion Women. We just finished uh, doing this. Many of you hopefully got the email that, that announces all this. We, uh, we have a website called Title IX Schools that lets, ever, lets so schools and families know just how badly that their school is discriminating against the girls and women who are at those schools. So, and this is the aggregate data here. Um, women every single year, so if, if they had equality, meaning one in 10 men, one in 10 women, if they had equality, women would be getting 225,000 more opportunities to participate in college sports. Um, they would be getting uh, $1.1 billion more in college scholarships. And annually, this is every single year, year after year after year, that schools are spending our tax dollars for boys and men and not spending it for us. One of the really great points that uh, Christina was making earlier about how important it would be for, uh, for athletes to be able to bring the cases, to have them be the plaintiffs. We have the exact same issue of trying to get athletes to remedy this because the, the only remedy action is private causes of action. It is a pl plaintiff's lawyer suing to get compliance at the university. So we do a lot to try to get um, athletes, you know, right? But it is, when, when somebody says, well, the women won't sue, I have to tell you, look at the, these crazy numbers. The, we're have, even with these crazy numbers, women are being denied, are you ready? 72% of the opportunities that they should have. When the NCAA gives you a guide as to how much sex discrimination is going on, they only show you the bottom two numbers, the gray one, that's current women, and then the blue one, which is current men. And they'll say, like, see how they're both going up, we're adding opportunities for both men and women, right? And, but what they should be showing you is, if women were given equality, they would not be do what the men are making, but because there are so many more women in college, they should be getting the pink line. So the true discrimination gap is the gap between the pink and the gray line, and that's where you get 72% less than what they should have. They're supposed to have, I think it's 535,000 total uh, opportunities, uh, but they're, they're not getting them because the NCAA quit doing any enforcement, the, um, Conferences don't do any enforcement. The OCR doesn't do really any enforcement. If they do come in with enforcement, somebody will say, uh, because we don't have the same field that the boys have. And they will work on that one issue and they will leave the rest of the sex discrimination behind. So tomorrow or Tuesday, hopefully tomorrow, uh, we're gonna file a hundred OCR complaints against schools. Yeah. So we've got, we've got, <clears throat> we have the 50 worst, and then on top of that, we have the 50 worst from the Power Five, because that's where the money is, and there's still, uh, uh, University of North Carolina at Chapel Hill needs to add 300 and 60 women to its athletic department, and over $6 million in college scholarship. That's just one school, and they're power five. They're in the ACC, they absolutely, don't tell me they don't have a lot of money. So, it's against this backdrop that we're now asking women to take even less. It's against this backdrop Champion Women and the Women's Sports Policy Working Group, um, we have had a petition. We've gotten lots of help from icons and many of you out here. I think Mara gave me a list. So of, um, we have a petition that we've given to Congress, we've given it to the Biden administration, et cetera. But it has 
467 Olympians, Paralympians, and U.S. national team, or uh, national team athletes, not necessarily U.S. Uh, we have 4,000 competitive athletes, many of them, you know, Division I, uh, you know, really top-notch athletes. Um, we have their family members. We have coaches and administrators. Um, the, the first iteration of this petition is what we sent to World Athletic, uh, to, to um, USA Swimming and to um, World Aquatics to let them know that like the sports world is, really, is behind you. Um, it's interesting, we've gotten almost no coverage on the petition. When you read the names, they're total icons. They are, um, you know, I'm not gonna read out because it's gonna hurt somebody's feelings if I <laughs> don't call out everybody. But, right, so we, ha we do have this, um, this, this issue of like, well, okay, they've spoken out, they signed their name, they're, they want to be kept up as to what we're doing, and yet we can't like, you know, the, the New York Times, Washington Post, the Wall Street Journal, et cetera, right? We cannot get this published as to just how the sports community is fully on board with protecting the women's category. Right. Have you, are you, now, Nancy, yeah. bringing it back to Title IX, yeah. did, this went to Congress with, did you send this along with your comments about Title IX? We, we talked about it in our comments, but we didn't, we didn't send this because we had already sent it okay. several times. Yeah, like as it's been growing and as it's been updating, you can still go to um, championwomen.org and at the very, on the line, it says sign the petition and there it is. And you know we we will continue to grow the petition. It's almost 9,000 people, um, and I have to say it's much easier for people to sign as they can go online and see. All, right, the petition's there. I want to say it's um, it's like 190 pages at this point. Right, be people put what box that they're in in terms of their sports participation. Um, can so, you, before, yeah. I need to, we need to yeah, um, move get on. that, well, yeah, but I want to make sure that we touch on the history of Title IX, as you, as you told it, 50 years old, and how important it was, now what the Biden administration is doing. Okay. So if you could just quickly touch on that. Right. And Absolutely. Then we'll ask the okay. It would be a huge mistake to think, yay, Title IX passed, and we won, and look where we are right now. Please, nobody tell that narrative. The story is, is that, uh, Donna Lopiano and uh, Christine Grant and so many other amazing women who were just one generation ahead of me who um, gave their professional careers so that we all could have equal opportunities in sports. We have the legal right to equality. Getting that, um, you, you, you wouldn't think it would be that hard, but it is. So uh, it's even hard, and I would say that if I had to do it over again with my career, I would have spent less time making sure that women had the right to it and, and instead doing, you know, closing that 72% gap, getting more opportunities, making schools offer more opportunities for girls and women in sports. So with, um, the law passes in 1972, 1975, we have regulations from the Department of Education that specifically say that schools can have sex segregated sports and they tell schools how to do it and not only sex segregated sports but there's other things uh, but they tell a school how to measure equality in those 1975 regulations they're phenomenal so they you know they they say you have to have equal scholarship dollars, and you've got to treat them the same way. And it gives a, a very detailed list that you know that only somebody who'd been an athletic director at University of Texas or University of Iowa is going to know all of those different ways of facilities and equipment and sponsorship and medical care and all those, all those ways to make sure that men and women are treated equally. Um, so in uh, the year, uh, 2000, the Bush administration, second Bush administration, uh, 
needs votes in Iowa, so they, um, the, the, the Iowa wrestlers said, if you, um, if you will like get Title IX reduced here, then we will help you be elected. The, the wrestling community will get behind you. So Bush wins, and sure enough, the, they do a one, two, three in terms of attacking the regulations at the Department of Education, filing a lawsuit for that. Two is in specific lit, lit, uh, litigation and trying to say that Title IX is a quota and that it's not fair and that it's hurting men's sports. So we, on our side, it was just like this in terms of we had you know weekly or biweekly calls. Everybody had had things that they had to do on their list, and uh, and we had media and we had you know the whole package of okay, how do we attack this onslaught? And uh, they formed a commission. Donna Deverona was on the commission that was looking at how can we, the, the name of the commission was, um, uh, is, is the, what is it? Yeah, right, yeah. And the, and. Opportunity right, in Athletics that is commission. commission. Right, the, the, the name of the committee was not what it should have been, which is how do we make Title IX weaker? How do we not give women equal but, opportunities in so sports? So Nancy, your, yeah. your, yeah. I'm gonna, okay. your point on this is that Title IX has been at risk the whole way along. The whole way. And the, the Biden administration's recent rewrites are just another attempt to undermine that. Can you, just in a couple sentences, tell us like what the equating sex to gender, how that undermines yeah, yeah, yeah. the original okay. intent? Yep. Um, yeah, don't, okay. So, um, what, what the Bush administration, what, what the Biden administration is now trying to do is, um, so Title IX protects <coughs> students from discrimination based on sex, okay? A three-letter word. Our beloved um, um, uh, Supreme Court Justice, what's her name? Ruth? Saint, no, the next no, one. Ruth, Ruth, Bader. Ruth Bader Ginsburg. Started talking much more about gender instead of sex because it was like you're talking to 50 year old men You've got sex 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 at all right so here if you use the word gender It'll be easier for you to you know accommodate, but what that did is um, or Is it's very confusing? Um, well, some people want it to be confusing as to what does sex discrimination mean initially we wanted to make sure that sexual orientation was covered by sex there was no way that uh, you were gonna get the same kind of protection sort of in the front door with legislation. So instead, right? And when sexual orientation, being a gay or lesbian, um, w when that went through, then j um, uh, tr transgender people tacked on as well. So it was, sec it's called SOGI, Sexual Orientation Gender Identity, SOGI. Uh, so, um, so the Biden administration, right since the very beginning of when uh, he was campaigning, said that he was going to do this. Um, in the the first his first uh, two years, they got the Equality Act actually to pass the House, which would have made all civil rights that have the word sex to include sexual orientation and gender identity. Okay, that's what the Equality Act would do. What they're trying to do now with Title IX in the statute is through the Department of Education trying to make the statute which says sex discrimination to make that equal gender identity without like having the public really have a grip on it or really be supportive, okay? Or, or even no. Like a, 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 yeah, exactly, yeah, a real, robust public debate. Okay, so he proposes regulations. Um, the Biden administration proposes regulations uh, that will change Title IX to include Sochi. When they first came out, there was such a backlash about having, including sport, that he actually issued more rules um, that were woefully inadequate, just fantastically. But, but we all, you know, got to celebrate those little wins, need to pat ourselves on the back that it is because of pressure from us that the changes that came in were there at all. 
okay? So the changes that came in were, um, were um, the, this idea that, um, um, that safety and fairness were going to be important considerations. Okay, but you know what the, what the, what the, the um, you know, how, how you're gonna enforce these regulations is once again asking 14 to 22 year olds to bring a lawsuit against their school to be able to uh, participate in sports and to make sure that the category stays all female. Um, it is an issue of trying to get current students to be able to bring these causes of action. I don't know of another way. That's one thing that we have another petition, Champion Women, to try to get uh, the Department of Ed to do more enforcing. That is, they're like kind of the police of Title IX, right? They're supposed to be like the government agency that's supposed to be making it happen. Okay, so that was the good part, all right? And this is the bad part, which is you didn't even try to take into account the experiences of women. You didn't even try. This was all about the experience and the feelings of men and how important it is to, to center women's sports experience and women's experiences. Um, so that, so um, I hope what's clear is that the Biden administration is trying to change the regulations Many groups here, including us, including ICONS, and many, many others, uh, have, have sent in comments to stomp on them and say, stop, you know, to, the, these are terrible regulations. Because just think of the impact when we were sitting before Linda Blade, others were saying, um, row about what percentage of their Olympic team plays sport in college in the United States. So, um, Nancy, this, this I'm going to make you, because you're impact. taking my question for okay. Doreen. Okay. okay. <laughs> thank you, though. Yeah, sure, All right. Oh, thank, <laughs> you. thank you. <laughs> thank you for that background in history. Doreen, I want to give you a chance to expand upon both talking about the impacts of the proposed changes, yeah. Yeah. Um, expressing those, laying them out for us, and then what accounts for the lack of public awareness? So you, we, it seems like generally, I mean, I talk to people even in the sports communities that would be highly interested in knowing that title, yeah. wanting to know that Title IX is changing and there's not awareness. So both the impacts and the sure, lack sure. of awareness. Yeah, thank you, Kim. Uh, well, first of all, I think we just want to make it really clear that what they did with Title IX was basically turn it on its head. Yeah. Instead of women being able to be protected anymore on the basis of sex, we're now prioritizing the idea of gender identity, which is a perception about oneself, to be the basis on which sports teams, schools, every, at every level, every type of sport has to make decisions about inclusion. Okay, and not only that, you have to do it in such a way that if you're going to have male and female teams at all, okay, which is the first question they have to ask of themselves at schools, is that it does it in such a way to minimize harm based on gender identity, all right? And we understand now, seeing what's happened in sport, seeing what's happened at the NCAA, what it means to, quote, from their side, what is it gonna be to minimize harm? So that, per, right at the top, it, you know, prioritizes the feelings of an individual over the rights of every woman in sport. And that's the danger, and so we see that, what sexual harassment in the locker room. We've seen it. We've seen women having to defend or, you know, stand up for themselves. I'm so grateful for the young women that were here this, at this conference that we're trying to support to stand up and say that kind of sexual harassment, there's no place in sport for women. But now we're, the Biden administration is forcing a mandate on, the, on America, on American sports, if they finalize this in the way that they've proposed, which they're serious about, let me tell you, they're very serious about it to basically double, make our work even that much harder to overcome uh, the kind of challenges that we now face, which are much more you know, case by case in one sense. But when you have a mandate from the federal government that has every federal dollar of education to that institution attached to it, that's a pretty big hammer. And so, you know, and what we're already seeing is the possibility for how that will re result in scholarships and recruitment. Look, we've talked a lot about fairness. 
Is it fair if every uh, sports team has one trans-identifying male on it and they're competing against each other? Would that be fair? Well, it might be if you have a policy that allows for trans inclusion, one trans inclusion athlete in every sport, or if you're up against another team with a trans identifying athlete. Okay, so that is even open for question. Uh, recruitment right now, we're already seeing it come through into college, um, and that's gonna be something I know we yeah. talk more about. Um, so we've got area, uh, the area of two of just, um, we've talked about this a lot. Uh, the fact that women are going to be disaffected about even participating in sports anymore. It's going to it's going to result in loss of a lot of their, uh, uh, you know, own achievements, but it also just the the denial of even wanting to get involved. Concern Women for America, we've had calls, we've had contacts from aunts, from mothers, from others. They're saying, my daughter is saying, if this is what it's going to be, what's the point, mom? My, my niece is not going to even try out for sports as an 11-year-old because there's a trans-identifying male on the other team. She's not even trying out now. She's not even going to get involved in sports. That's the real impact. I want to bring up one thing else. You said the U.S., and we have quite an international audience here, and it was mentioned on the earlier panel that Title IX actually impacts women around the world. It does. This and is I, an international yes. issue, and we are the place where a lot of elite athletes from mm -hmm. around the world come to find fair competition and training ground to, Im I mean, to be a representative of their country, and it's, it's important internationally. That's right, and I really appreciated that comment because it gave me a perspective and a little bit of a light bulb going off to understand that everything we're doing right now to challenge the NCAA, and we've only got to up our effort and uh, turn the heat up so high that they can't ignore it, but that it does have an impact that will speak around the world, and that these young athletes that are coming here to train in America to, to succeed in their sport, I mean, we know that uh, Rika Gorky, who lost her yep. place into the finals in the NCAA 500-yard uh, uh, yard Again, in, yep. the, in Thomas's race, you know, she was an, a, an international athlete. And so we understand now, and that even gives me more resolve and, and, and is sort of connection with, with us across the globe to realize that what we're doing in this space is gonna matter across the world. And I think something else I got to speak with you about when you were, you were talking about centering, um, who, whose needs and desires are being center, centered mm -hmm. here. And it was in a conversation with you, when I was, we were talking about what's spelled out in these rewrites about the justification um, for a male athlete to be given the privilege to determine what sports team he wants to play on. The three things that were spelled out in there were mental, physical, and social benefit. And I believe it was you who said, you asked me a question, you said, so if those are the basis, but if it's mental, physical, and social benefit, why is there a difference between someone who I, a male who identifies as transgender and a male who doesn't? They would get the same physical, mental, and social benefit. What would preclude them from being allowed to participate on a women's team if it would elevate their cause or right. the, it was that was you, right? Well, maybe. I think, I think so. <laughs> but I think we all have a lot of uh, criticisms about what this is going to mean and, and, and how you measure what is harm, right? Who's going to be the judge of what de minimis harm is, which is the standard they're wanting to put in law? Uh, I think that there's so much confusion around this and, and how we prioritize that we all come to the very same conclusion that we are at this conference is there's only a category and a standard that, that makes sense and, and that can be defensible in an objective way. Um, and so, you know, we're, uh, it's appalling what these rules are suggesting, what this Biden administration is wanting to do to American women. Can and, you share and a I little would just, I can't, I mean, I'm hoping that what we have the opportunity is to stop the train before it gets too far out of the station, even if they choose to finalize the rules. Can you, back to the first question I gave you, can you just speak a little bit about the overreach? Why are people unaware of this? Yeah, sure. Well, I, I think unaware, you know, so many policies have come through the back door, 2010 in, in NCAA, everything that's happened in the IOC. The fact that the rulemaking process is really m messy. Uh, legislation sometimes is a little more overt, and so we see it happening in Congress. The rulemaking process is really messy in Washington. They do allow for a public comment period, uh, but they give you a, a short amount of time usually to do that. What's amazing, and it really is a testament to what's happened here over the last year because we saw it coming, that between two different proposed rules, we had 400,000 public comments come into the U.S. Department of Education. And that really, and it's record breaking for any particular rule. Um, and, uh, but I think that the backdoor way in which these things get, get uh, you know, 
get developed. Um, and, and certainly the, the legalese, the bureaucraties that we face, I mean, it's really hard to be accessible. So the fact that ICONS has broke, broke it down and for public comment campaigns, and many of our organizations did, made all the difference in the world. And we, the other important piece here is that they're required in responding to these comments that come in. Uh, they can provide the legal foundation for challenging final rules. And so what our organization was doing, and I know others were, were strategically putting out arguments that they, we knew could, would be the basis for legal challenge. And that's the kind of thing that the state attorneys general uh, and other organizations are going to be using to um, to file lawsuits when these when these or when these final rules come out. But again, I just can't emphasize enough that the landscape of the future will depend on where we land with regulations on Title IX because they are the foundational civil rights laws for our country, for our schools that are governing sports. And I have to say that it's amazing to me that the NCAA can get away with overruling what, what has been the understood understanding of sex discrimination. And every member institution that gets federal dollars, which are all of them in the NCAA uh, uh, membership in, uh, group, um, somehow think that NCAA is the higher power and authority. And so they were able just to minimize and, and discriminate against females in the, on teams that we've seen and subject them to harassment and other things that we've just seen in the last few years. And, and then somehow think that they're not under the law. So there's a lot here that needs to be worked out. And our organization has filed civil rights complaints. We filed three civil rights complaints against universities. The first, Franklin Pierce University, C.C. Telfer was the first athlete in 2019 to, to win a national championship. We filed against the University of Montana, uh, who had June Eastwood that won the Big Sky Championship and then was shut down for COVID, so they didn't have a national championship. We filed against UPenn the day that uh, Leah Thomas uh, uh, you know, competed and won the national championship. All of these have been formal civil rights complaints. It was something our organization could do on behalf of female athletes. And again, that's an administrative challenge. It's not a legal challenge. But um, those are the kinds of things we need to be doing. And I appreciate knowing that you're gonna, going to uh, be filing uh, complaints as well because we have to do everything in our pot in, that we can as organizations and individuals and institutions. Thank you. All right, well, I'd like to hear from the radical feminists. <laughs> so Liz, can you um, just talk a little bit about the radical feminist position on what's going on with Title IX? Where is your organization coming from on this? And uh, just share your perspective. Awesome, so I'm gonna be as brief as I can with a definition of radical feminism, because it seems like some people don't really know what it means. I had a talk with Doreen earlier, and it sounds like people are saying that you're a radical feminist, which um, I, th I think or, or they're, they're saying that this is a... We're, we're friends of the radical feminists. Yeah, you're yeah. friends with us, but yeah, it's, it's, it's pretty dangerous for politicians if we're sitting up here together and we're completely on the same page. Um, but yeah, radical feminism is uh, based on the belief that women are oppressed on the basis of sex by a male supremacy hierarchy called patriarchy. And that is where we're coming from. In our advocacy in our lives, we aim to center women and when you center women, you learn very quickly that women don't get to say no as often as we would like to. So I know there's been a lot of discussion around language and tact, but I already tanked my career, so I can just say no. Women is our word. You can't have the word woman. It was never yours to take. It's ours. <laughs> yeah. Like, why, why do we have women's spaces? Well, we said you can't be in them, you're not women, you don't get to be in our spaces, and that is the end of it. So often, because, because our position is to center women, we're often tasked with defending women's boundaries and being able to empower women to speak out and say no when things make them uncomfortable, which is sadly lacking. In this case, uh, with the Title IX proposed changes, what that would do is by ta erasing the word woman, by not allowing ourselves to identify ourselves as a sex class and to identify the basis of our oppression on our sex, we are being told that we can't solve the problems that we face as a category of people, as, a, as an oppressed sex class. By taking that away and replacing it with gender identity, what that's doing is removing, what that would do if it um, continues is remove all the civil rights protections that women have earned for ourselves on the basis of sex. 
and it means it, it's, t it's not taking away the reality of what we experience, it's taking away our ability to advocate for ourselves. And that's why we have to hold the line and say, you can't have our protections. So for these, any of these changes, the first um, day one executive order, any of the notices of proposed rulemaking, what, that, what they do is remove our ability to advocate for ourselves and to say no, and that is unacceptable. Can you dig straight into Title IX? Why is that relevant to what Wolf is working on? And so I, I should be obvious, it's our, it's our single piece of legislation that recognizes women on the basis of sex, but can you expand upon why Wolf is taking a position and what other work you're doing that is implicated with Title IX? Absolutely, yes. Yeah. So Title IX is this fantastic piece of civil rights le legislation because it's designed to center women. It's designed to give women proper credit for all the work they've done. Female scholars who, have, who need equal opportunity, who've been historically left out of certain fields, but also female athletes need to be recognized for the hard work and training that they're doing, even though they don't have the male sex advantage when it comes to competitive sports. So one of the problems with boundaries is that, that if people, if predators, not every man is a predator, but you know what I'm saying, if, if predators know that they can get away with pushing boundaries, we know they're going to escalate. That fear that Riley Gaines felt when she saw Will Thomas, who was a man, undress in front of her and nobody was able to call him out on it and she was, she received this pushback from saying no. The concussion, um, where's that um, young woman earlier who got a concussion? We know that if they see that they can get away with it, they're not going to stop there. It's only going to escalate. And earlier today, somebody said that this isn't going to change until a woman gets disabled or killed. That's absolutely right because it seems like this is this is this issue escalates. Our lives are at stake. The fear that we feel is because we are in, we know that that's where it's not going to stop. That's where it's going to end. And we're already seeing this in very vulnerable populations of women, such as domestic abuse survivors and incarcerated women. These are women who have already been taught their entire lives that they're not allowed to say no. And if they say no, then it's because they're evil and they don't care about other people. So in one of our major lawsuits, um, Chandler v. CDCR, we're representing four incarcerated women who are housed with men, many of whom are, have a history of violence against women or are convicted rapists under California's SB 132. And there's a Letters for Incarcerated Women project that you can find online. Now, one of these women writes that she was forced into a cage with or a male rapist, no escape, just because this person said that he was a woman and this woman said that this man got on top of her and said, this would be a lot easier if you were a lot nicer. And so when we're being told to be kind and when we're being told to be accepting, this is what we're being told to accept. We're being told that if we, we're being punished for speaking out and saying no, and when we do that, th they learn that they can get away with it. And so that is what is at stake is these are our sisters, these are our sisters' lives. And that is why it has become so important for the hardline radical feminists to do everything we can in order to ensure that Title IX protections remain as they are. So up here on this lovely slide, um, I know I'd right to, to segue right into that, but I am so proud of the work our organization has done here. Yes. <laughs> I printed out every key court filing we've done since um, Hecox v. Little amicus brief in 2020. Yes, it is, it's this brick. This, this is the brick that we should be throwing at Stonewall. But. Well, and I'll just say it's been a privilege that um, Concerned Women for America and Wolf have jointly filed several amicus briefs already in sports cases. I mean, we're working together in a very constructive partnership. We have been for over five years. And it's been a real testament, I think, to not only, you know, just what's the groundwork that was laid for, for the organizations that we've been able to build together as well. Never say women can't work together. Yeah, can I, can I also say, hold on, there, there are two statutes. You gotta just, use the microphone. <laughs> there are two statutes, not just one, that deal with sex discrimination in sports. The first, as we've been talking about, Title IX. The second one is called, well, it's a long name, 
the Ted, <clears throat> the Ted Stevens Olympic and Amateur Sports Act. It bars discrimination based on race, but if the Equality Act passes, that's gonna equal SOGI, sexual orientation and gender identity. And then, we're right, so there's about the same number of athletes in both the college system and in the high school and college system and the Olympic system. They're both about 16 million. Um, so, so we need to make sure that whatever we do includes the Olympic both. Sports Act as right. well as what happens in schools. Right. Thank you. I want to jump on something Liz pointed out um, with regard to what's going on in the prisons and with women being allowed to say no and what we're teaching our daughters. One of our comments um, that we were encouraging people to make on the Title IX um, rewrite <laughs> or reinterpretation was that it, it completely ignored the damage that would be done to women and girls, our well-being, if we're told to ignore the reality of biological sex. So ignoring the harm uh, to women and girls when they are told that biological sex doesn't matter, you need to overlook it, particularly in physical contest, is communicating the idea that it is the fault of women and girls if they are physically weaker than men and boys. That there is something inherently wrong with their body if they can't keep up. And the idea that when we are in a public arena and it is acceptable or necessary for women to overlook the strength and power differences of the sexes, and they must, men and boys are allowed to strike at, throw balls at, aim for, wrestle, tackle, shove, push aside, a woman in public, in a place where we are supposed to be celebrating what women are capable of. How much more are we teaching young girls and grown women that it is acceptable for this behavior to come from men who are more physically powerful in places where we aren't seen because it's even cheered on in public. So it's unbelievably damaging to the psyche of women to be told that what you experience must be overlooked in public. What you live with must be overlooked. And this is a, this is a terrorizing future as a parent to think that this is something that would be to passed on to our daughters. So I wanted to capitalize on that. I, I want to come back to Doreen really quickly. Um, I, sh I asked her to speak about the conflicts that yeah, are arising yeah, legislative, between right, legislation, right. state and federal. And I we think there was a slide up there, too, on state law. And, and, and Christiana kind of shared this the other day, but this gets a little more granular. You know, we've had 22 and, oh, and wow. um, almost 23, I think, North Carolina. Thankfully, where Peyton McNabb's from, North Carolina is going to get across the finish line uh, by overturning a governor's veto next week. Uh, so that one's highlighted there. But you can see what the, what the map looks like now. Red Pennsylvania means that they actually did get it across the, uh, the legislature, but it was vetoed the governor last year. So that's kind of in that place. They've got to start over. The dark green shows where states where they over, uh, overruled a governor's veto. And in some of those cases, they were Republican governors and some Democrats. So you see where we're coming out here, it's, it's not necessarily equal, although definitely balanced on one side. We've had a couple states that um, uh, this year had some Democrats join Republicans, um, but the underlines there show that the states that don't have it to the college level, okay, so there are four of those. Georgia, Georgia actually is an interesting case. It, it just kicked it to the high school association, so it's not really a state law, so we don't really count, we don't count Georgia, but I just wanted you to know that they did act at least to that extent. Um, but it's an important recognition to see where we are with state laws because when you have 23 states in the Union of the United States, that's nearly half, okay? And if you're going to have a, a, a rule that's put down from the federal government that all of a sudden seeks to overrule the very clear uh, prohibition on male competition in female sports, um, that's a pretty big conflict. And what we do know is not only you take the states aside right now what's passed, what we also know that the Congress of the United States has never said that sex means gender identity for Title IX. Never. never. 
there's never been any, the only thing that has happened, and this is very significant, is that the House of Representatives passed the Protection of Women and Girls in Sports Act this year, which says that Title IX explicitly means that female sports are for women, females only. And so if, there, if that's the intent of Congress that's been said, you know, that's been established this year, uh, then you don't think the Biden administration has a, has a place to stand in court. But I have to say that we've got courts that want to rule all over the map on this, and a lot of it depends on the judge and, um, and what the challenge is going to be. But we have a very strong case to be made to challenge Biden's Title IX rules and set up this because there is a conflict already set up. And uh, the overreach in the executive branch, it's, cause, it's called it, it, it legislative rulemaking or executive overreach, uh, uh, by executive fiat, when a federal agency, in this case the U.S. Department of Education, tries to establish authority or rules that Congress has never given them explicitly the, uh, the uh, direction uh, to, um, to, to take. So we have you know, three branches of government in the United States, and that, that separation of powers, as we call it, is super important, and especially in a case like this, and will be the thing that we're uh, using and the arguments that we're using moving forward. But I have to say the map looks good, and if you're looking at it through the end, lens of the Power Five Conference, for example, then the SEC is the place to send daughters to compete because every single one of those states, uh, with the exception of Georgia that hasn't talked at the, at the, at the uh, again, they haven't ruled at the higher education level, every one of those SEC states now has, uh, including because of Alabama and Texas, this year passed for college, they didn't the first time, but went on to pass for college. Uh, every single one of those SEC schools now is under the rules that uh, female women's sports are for female athletes. Thank you. I have one question I want to um, have Nancy follow up on, and then we'll take a question or two from the audience. Uh, so you made an important point about the Ted Stevens Act. So Title IX is applicable to K through college, all schools. All schools. And um, that we recognize that Title IX impacts the international athletes as well. But the Ted Stevens Act is what governs our Olympic movement and that has sex-based protections in it. So can you talk just for a minute or two about the, the conflict between those, you were saying the Equality Act, we don't expect the Equality Act to go through any longer, but the conflict between what the Biden administration is putting in place for Title IX and the Ted Stevens Act and what the ramifications would be for the Olympic movement as well. Yeah, if, if, um, if uh, sex equals, uh, just be closer. If, if sex, you got it? Yeah. yeah. <laughs> Equal, if sex equals gender identity, and that's recognized in law that that's what it means, then inevitably it is going to go into other areas. It's going to go, yeah, into, um, it, you know, not, not just the Olympic movement, but, um, you know, into all these other areas as well. So we've got to make sure that we're doing everything we can. The Ted Stevens Act, I mean, this is has huge ramifications for the protection of female athletes, even from I issues like Larry Nassar and sexual assault. I mean, that's part of the safety, yeah, yeah I'm, right? I'm actually mm -hmm. on a federal commission right now. So as a result of Larry Nassar, um, the only difference, the only thing that was unique about Larry Nassar abusing five to 800 gymnasts was scale, how many athletes. The vast majority of coaches who abuse their athletes have like five or 10, but they don't have 500, right? So that was the only difference. We've got two pieces of federal legislation passed as a result of the Larry Nassar situation. We're on, I'm on a commission right now uh, uh, with um, uh, 15 other people that is looking at what kind of changes that we need to be making to the, the Ted Stevens Olympic and Amateur Sports Act. The, I mean, as somebody, so you all saw the picture of me, right? Okay, when I look like just like that, strong as could be, I was raped. I was out running. Duke has two campuses between East and West, and uh, somebody grabbed me and they took me into the woods and I didn't get out of there for two and a half hours. I'm very lucky to be alive, very lucky. And um, you know, when, when we talk about men's violence against women, when we talk about violence against women, do you know that in my 
lifetime. I have never heard of somebody who has a solution for me when, you know, to go be able to go out and run. The solution for me not to be raped is to stay home. That's the solution. So we haven't even begun to tackle the issues of violence against women. And it is male violence against women. We haven't even begun. And we have all these reports that just all in crazy bad news, but there's no legislative proposal, there's no policy proposal, there's no, there's no change in that. And now you want to give men the opportunity to come into our spaces, into our changing rooms. Let me make it as stark as I know how to make it, which is women biologically uh, through uh, evolution, we are really good at being able to tell if somebody's male or female from like a mile away. Men are not as good at it. Sometimes you'll have police officers who will look like, why are you trying to get this person out? They can't recognize this is a male body. Okay. When we see a male coming into a space they shouldn't be in, are we allowed to react right then? Or do we have to wait until they actually try to rape somebody or until they actually rape somebody? Our, our, is our safety, when I think of what it took to recover from that rape, uh, most, you know, some physically, but emotionally, I had a case of PTSD, this was 1981, it was before we really knew about PTSD. So, like, are, like, do you take that so lightly as to what we have to live with by being women? And you're, you haven't even have any, the, 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 there really is no, we, we still have so much violence against women, it's not being solved. To try to now allow males into our spaces is just absolute folly and so insulting to women. Thank you for sharing. Uh, gosh, I almost don't want to take a question because I feel like that was such a strong note to end on. <laughs> but I, th we have time for one question. Um, if you, you can take the, thank you. Wow. <laughs> Just insulting but insidious to ask us to overlook the reality of our sex. Please go ahead. So I'm thinking about the intersection of a couple of things that Doreen said and what Nancy said in terms of the legislation that is protecting women in sport and then the, fu the funding. One of the things that California has done, and I don't know about other states, but I, I think several others do this as well. California has a number of states that they refuse to allow state funding. They won't allow anybody who gets state funding to go travel to those states because they don't comport with whatever California's ideas are, whether that's on abortion, whether that's on this sort of stuff, you know, on LGBTQ protections or whatever. So recently, California has just added a number of states, I think three more states, to their list of states that they will not provide state funding to. And what I was reading uh, in some article that I read about that, it impacts the athletes who are at the state universities who can't get state funding because they're not allowed to do that. So they have to separately fundraise, which means that, of course, if the men are able to separately fundraise, they're going to get more money. And that means, of course, that the women are not going to be able to travel. There's a whole bunch. So I was just, I figured I would toss that one out and ask you guys to address that. And if there are well, other opportunities for people in those states, which mercifully I'm not, to advocate to get some of those stupid policies. Well, reversed. and I think that's just a, a further doubling down on how they're discriminating against women, right? I, I, did, I think that California is a, obviously seems to be a special case on a lot of things, but I say, you know, hold all the national championships in the SEC and then tell their athletes they're going to stay home or have to get money and then, you know, bring it to a head. I mean, I, I just feel like the NCAA right now is in a tough position uh, and I'm not going to defend them. Uh, they, you know, started making noise early on when Idaho was the first state to pass that, oh, we're going to boycott Idaho. We're not going to give them any postseason championships. This is how we're going to do it. You know, in North Carolina, which is why this is an amazing reality, 
result, remember they pulled out their uh, postseason championships when the bathroom bill in Car North Carolina, which was intended to protect women in, in their special private spaces from males intruding on them, okay? Right now we're all looking at that as being, you know, like that's what we're all after. You know, four years ago or five years in 2016 when that happened, it was like a hammer on the state of North Carolina and, and you know, silenced every state really for some time. So they're now just recovering. But this is the kind of thing, you know, the, the NCAA at this point, because we have 23 states virtually, they can't boycott states. They can't, they can't hold these, I mean, the biggest, Conferences now, the most money that they get, you know, that are in here, the biggest, you know, states right now outside of California in terms of numbers uh, are on this list, are on this map. And so we've completely neutered the capacity of the NCAA to be as powerful as it wishes it could be because of what we were able to accomplish in the states. And that was, that's been a very intentional strategy. And I think what you're pointing out about, you know, the ramifications of policies that are going to be based on these kinds of, you know, we're not going to give any, we're not going to let you travel to that state. I guarantee, I wonder if Governor Newsom went down to uh, Florida when they had some kind of DNC meeting, right? And he got, I don't know if it was on a private jet or what, I, maybe not with state funds. But, you know, has anybody been tracking all the uh, California uh, officials and where they're actually going for all these meetings that are happening outside of the state? I doubt it. Uh, so, you know, they, they try to... to you know, rattle the saber and, and try to sound all big and bad on this stuff. But it does come down to this actual uh, rubber meets the road kind of impact or potential impact. And I think we should not, we need to be very aware of that and, and, and try to raise it and expose it. Thank you. I'm going to summarize this panel with, uh, we all thought that women's rights were secured. I'm sure a lot of us in here thought Title IX was done. And I think what we're learning is that the law may be written, but unless we put it to work and we test it and hold it to account, it isn't actually real. So um, I'm going to close with that. We have a hard stop here in just under an hour, and we want to have our closing remarks, which is meant to be a very interactive session. So thank you so much. Thank you. Okay, I'd like to welcome Mary O'Connor and Marshy to the, to the stage. <laughs> okay, if everyone wants to just stand up for a moment and stretch. This is it, folks. This is it. Okay, a little more energy. Woo, yeah. Play a little music, do a little dance. Okay, I'm going to lead off uh, this last session, uh, and it's entitled Let's Go. And I know we've heard some really challenging scenarios and stories about the major obstacles that we have to overcome, but I also want us to leave here empowered and positive and energized because we can make a difference and we are making a difference. So I'm going to have a few opening comments focused on what we've done with our Icons Rowing chapter and then I have some questions for our fabulous Icons co-founders. Okay. So the purpose of this session is to share ways that individuals can engage in our mission to protect fairness for women in sports and to hear your ideas. So we really want to be interactive, and I'm going to shorten up some of my comments. We have to be activists. Silence does not work. You've heard this message over and over again, repeated by numerous speakers. Sharon Davies, no time to be nice anymore. Literally, our lives are on the line. Our opportunity for fairness and equality. Each of us can communicate a message. Oh, let's see if the clicker is going to work. Okay, so I shared this story yesterday. I'll just be very brief. You know, I just came from a middle class background. There's no high girls uh, sports in my high school. I got accepted to Yale University. Everyone was so proud. I go there on financial aid. I say, I'm going to row. I could row because I could learn to row. 
And, you know, it wasn't like I was trying to get on the tennis team competing with all the girls who had been to prep school who had coaches. Hang on. And, <laughs> I couldn't. I couldn't. So, so I go. I start rowing. I love it. We don't have a locker room at the boathouse. The men do. It's a 30-minute bus ride to and from campus. We're getting sick. So in the spring of my freshman year, we have this protest. We march into the athletic director's office. There she is, and strip with Title IX written on our bare chest and backs, and read a statement. Our captain read a statement. These are the bodies that Yale's exploiting. I know. Thank you. And I mean, I, I really didn't know this was going to be such a big thing. It was written up in the Yale Daily News, then the New York Times, and the International Herald Tribune picks it up, and the university is embarrassed into action. And we had an addition on the boathouse and a new locker room the following spring. I learned something very, very important. I learned that if I'm going to accept that it's okay for me not to be treated fairly, then I can expect not to be treated fairly. If I don't have the courage to stand up and say, this is wrong, I was at Yale University. And you're trying to tell me that you don't have the resources to give us a locker room at the boathouse? And if I'm going to say that's OK, what does that say for all the other women and all the other girls and my daughters yet to come, et cetera? So I learned a tremendous amount from this. And we gained great success. I mean, this launched rowing careers not just for myself, but for many of my, of my classmates who we were national champions. I stroked the U.S. Women's 8 to a bronze medal in 1979. Pat Spratlin, Edom is down there at the bottom left, and Carol Brown, two over on the bottom. She's also on our Icons executive team, Icons Rowing. They're awesome. And we, and we won a bronze medal against the Russians, the East Germans. Uh, they, I'm sorry. They were gold and silver. We were third. We beat the Yugoslavians. All those women were doping, okay? Um, so it was a major victory. In um, 1980, I was on the U.S. Olympic team, and we all remember that was the boycott year. But that didn't stop our advocacy because we created these T-shirts. And I don't know how well you can read them, but it says, has the Olympic rings, and then it says, Jimmy Carter's threat to national security. <laughs> and we wore those T-shirts when we all went to Washington, D.C., because the U.S. Olympic Committee invited us and our parents, we could go to D.C., to get our outfits, and that's my, me in the middle with my parents, and then, and then um, our Cox and Holly Hatton made these name badges that we gave out to all the Olympic athletes on all the teams that people could wear that had the message around the side, I'm here to make sure this never happens again. Now, we were not successful, obviously, in getting to compete despite the boycott, but it shows you that we have to speak up. I mean, even if we are not always successful, it is so important to let your voice be heard because the more you let your voice be heard, the easier it becomes, and the stronger your voice becomes for the next time. Okay, Icons Rowing, I'm listing there our executive team members, and we've been very active. We have an Icons Rowing petition. We wrote an op-ed talking about the horrific U.S. rowing gender policy, which you've heard me mention before, published in New Newsweek, Denies Fairness for Female Athletes. We had an article in Rowing News, which is kind of the big rowing publication here in the States. We also got them to put our white paper explaining why sex matters, you know, basic kind of biology, and why testosterone suppression does not level the playing field. Uh, we have had a beautiful truck going around at the NCAA Women's Rowing Championships with some fabulous messages on it. Um, and we edited uh, the Icons flyer, which I show you in the middle, to be a little more rowing specific. We've handed those out at numerous uh, rowing regattas. We've interacted with some of our friends across the pond in British rowing and we're very um, op um, optimistic uh, that British rowing that has reconsidered their transgender policy. They will be making an, an announcement in early September that that is going to be much more favorable and I am, and we will be prepared then to be talking about that. 
ICON's rowing talking about that to increase pressure on U.S. rowing to change their disastrous policy, which only protects competition for men. I mean, it's, it's so bad. We've uh, worked as with um, contacts that we have at World Rowing on the World Rowing uh, Sports Medicine Commission. There's been some directional improvement, but Ross Tuck, as Ross Tucker would say, if you go from five nanomoles of testosterone for 12 months to 2.5 for 24 months, it doesn't level the playing field. And this is the um, article that I've referenced a couple times in some comments that I wrote in my um, quarterly column, and we've been on podcasts. So, so it's really just every person here can help communicate the message. I can't emphasize how important I think that is. The more we're out there, the more that's published, the more we're talking about it, the easier it becomes for others to come on board. Because there are a lot of people who are afraid to speak up. And if they know that there are others standing here in this space, it becomes easier for them. So I'm now going to ask Kim and Marshy to talk about <laughs> the journey to activism. Marshy, would you like to start? Um, yeah, I come from a different um, era of sports. I uh, went to high school in the late 90s. I was in college in the early 2000s. And I think that I was naive uh, compared to many of the pioneers of t Title IX and took for granted what I just walked into. You know, I had a full athletic scholarship. We had equal locker rooms. We had beautiful gear. We, you know, so I, I look back and I think, you know, this was kind of a golden era in sports. I had a wonderful experience in college and I was able to win a national championship at the University of Arizona. Um, I was not confronted with the injustice that many women in this room had to face initially in the 70s to get there. So I really had this sense of appreciation through the events of the NCAA um, swimming uh, season with Leah Thomas. And um, what I have come to realize over the course of the past year and a half is that um, activism is absolutely necessary over and over again to demand um, our rights as women and particularly now in sports. So um, one of the things that launched me into even being on stage, which I still can't even imagine how, I, how this day has come because a year and a half ago, um, I knew nothing about the topic uh, at all. And I was, to be honest, living in a sense of um, denial because I assume someone else is taking care of this. And I also, um, like I said, took for granted uh, the right. So, so I um, was really in this complete state of shock and was um, suddenly put in a position where I had to decide, like, this is so bothersome to me as a former swimmer, but what could I possibly do? And um, what I realized is, uh, you know, Jen Say touched on this the other day, and many of you have, um, that even though I felt like I don't know, I don't have the right words, I don't know all of the scientific studies, I don't um, feel like my, my arsenal is like, filled to, to the level where I have any credibility to say anything, and yet, you know, I was just um, compelled to have to take a step. And so I r was communicating with former teammates about what was going on, and we decided to write a collaborative letter on behalf of our swim team alumni. And we've acquired almost <clears throat> 45 signatures now from swimmers from um, back in the 90s to present day, on the letter, it was, I actually reread it for the first time um, yesterday, or a couple days ago, and it's funny to read and kind of cringe at 
how we, we communicated and, and talked about the topic, but the fact that we did it anyways is what kind of brought me here today. I'm just going to say that, see, like, neither Marcy nor I knew what we were getting into. <laughs> but I hope all of you will realize, like, none of us thinks we're a leader. None of us think we're a leader. But every single one of you in this room needs to be. So take that mantle and run with it. Just become the leader you need to be. None of us have all the skills. Everyone has their own different road to follow in life. And every single one of us can carry an enormous burden for this. It has to be done. You're called. It's done. <laughs> it's, it, is, it is before you. And I, I hope that you will take up that job with a lot of passion. Um, I don't really want to talk about myself. I want to call Julie, who was at our meeting last year, who took these words to heart. She saw that there is a need, and she is in the belly of the beast in San Francisco, in the lesbian community, and she has turned her life this last year into an active life to speak out for women and girls. Would you please share a little bit about what you've done and just let people know how huge <laughs> you can be as a force. I know most of that applause is for my pants, and I appreciate it. <laughs> um, I wouldn't be here without Cynthia, my partner in crime. We oh, were both here. Cynthia, at here. yes. Uh, we both attended Icons. We both were in San Francisco, literally screaming in silence about what was going on, and unable to talk with our friends and partners, uh, our community, about this. Nobody would listen. They did what Kira Dansky described as just putting their hands over their ears and screaming, do not talk about this, literally. I did that in, I heard that in bed once and I was like, this is gonna be a long relationship. So, was that too private? I don't know. Um, I, I don't have boundaries anymore, you know what? I have better boundaries than I've ever had, but I also am not afraid to say anything that's the truth. And that's what I call on you all to do. So Cynthia and I found each other, we met, we exchanged numbers, we met immediately for drinks back in San Francisco, and we decided, let's just get going and talk to each other and drink together, at least we have each other. And then I was like, well, maybe I can make a business card that we could hand out to people that we felt like would be allies. And we were trying to find people, and I, we created Twitter accounts that were hilarious. And but we couldn't find anybody. And so we turned to icons and Kim and Marshy were like, how do we start? Can we have a Zoom meeting? What are we, what are we doing? And they're like, yes, absolutely. And then Marshy started sending me contacts that she found on Twitter because she knew how to search Twitter and I didn't. So we reached out to people that were saying on Twitter, we're in California. Tech skills, Marshy? Yes. <laughs> She's evolved a lot. <laughs> These guys are amazing. They've been supporting us throughout. But we did end up finding a few women in California and in San Francisco, and we started creating happy hours and inviting people out to talk. And we didn't know where it was gonna go. And now we have over 100 members, 120 members. Um, the happy hours have turned into networking like this, just like you would be in a bar here or talking at lunch here. It's the same thing. We found women who excel at activism, at protests, that would be me. Um, people that are very involved in legislative things in Sacramento. We've started a whole group in Sacramento. We also have a group in LA. So we are gonna be running Operation Overpass throughout the state of California. We have women traveling a long way to protest at events that boys are participating in against girls. We've, we've kept a couple boys out of the state championships. We, we get threatened a lot. We, this is the worst one. Well, we protest in front of gender clinics. Cynthia and I do this alone, often. And what people tell us that work at these gender clinics, they come out and say, you are literally causing kids to kill themselves right now. And I look at them and I say, really? What, where's that happening? Where is that, where's the genocide? You're causing the genocide. I'm like, you're full of it, you know what? Why don't you have a real conversation with us? So we try to talk to the people. But more than anything, we're out there doing it. 
uh, we plan things safely. We do not advertise where we're going to be because we don't want to get beaten up. We all have kids and lives and jobs. So we do what we can and we put the all out on social media and we get a lot of engagement with that and a lot more networking comes in to us because we do that. So that's our safe way of protesting, of putting ourselves out there, of spreading the word and of educating people. We'll hand out important things to people too while we're there, whatever it takes. No, they have established that she's just, they've, they have, we're sports, <laughs> totally focused on sports. Um, Julie has kind of expanded her activism, but she has taken, she, it, for her, sports was a passion, and this is, you know, an area that was important to her, and, and also to Cynthia, as Cynthia, well, I, I wish, I don't want to tell your story for you, but um, they, they came to our conference very concerned about the world of sports, and like many of us, when you know what's going on in sports, then your eye starts to be open to what else is happening to women in other areas, and it's really hard to not see it once you see it. So I, we just encourage Julie to follow her heart, but it's what I wanted her to be up on the stage for was to say she felt a passion to do something and she took the first step and did it. And that's what I want all of you to take away from this. Thank you, Julia. And, and we would welcome more ICONS chapters on yes. sports. <laughs> right? Yes, absolutely. We need advocacy in all the sports. I envision that there will be a group of, of women speaking up in every single, to every single sports governing body, establishing links within their communities, making sure that there aren't problems, sex-based discrimination of any kind um, being hidden or cast aside within the particular sports community that you want to be affiliated with and work well within. So we're actively looking to structure more of those organizations. We have a few going right now. Some will take a little longer to, I mean, we've got some fabulous people who are here in the audience, Lauren with US Triathlon, but um, we, we want to grow those groups. It's really important for every sports governing body to hear from the female advocacy position. So. Um, pass that on if you know of and, anyone. And you are best known in your sport, and you know the people. Like all of all of our members of Icons Rowing executive team are well known in our sport and respected, and and that is important because we're trying to take a message that's out there, where there is cons where some people don't agree, and we've heard repeatedly this concept of this sliding scale of fairness, where fairness matters more on the more elite level, but in quote, inclusion is so much more important on the younger level, which we've all heard wonderful talks today why that is just craziness. But so I do think that forming groups that focus on each sport can allow those groups to connect more effectively with their national governing bodies and help affect the policy change that we need. So next topic for you two Actually, icons. I want to say one more thing about this advocacy. Even if you're not, a, you don't have to be a prominent Olympian to go True. do a big thing in your sport. And certainly, if you're a parent, speak to your school board, speak to your coaches. If your coach says, well, I can't do anything because this is, this is my coach's association stance, go ask for a contact there. Just keep going up the ladder. Ask to speak to whoever's ear you can bend because they all need to hear from us. They need to hear from everyone at every level. Christiana Kiefer, the lawyer who spoke yesterday, talked about the landmark case of the St. John's County School District versus the name of the student, I forgot. Okay, that county is, is literally 1.5 miles from where I live in Florida. It's the county right next to where I live. I contacted the, the director of the school board and thanked her and said, please extend my thanks to every member of the school board and all the parents. They went through three court cases, as I recall, where they lost, and they pursued taking it to the circuit court level, which as we know is right below the Supreme Court, where they won. And that only happened because those parents and that school board had the guts to stick it out, put forth the financial resources to do it because they knew how important it was. So 
Kim is absolutely right. You don't have to be an Olympian. You don't even have to be an athlete, right? There's so many levels on which we can get engaged. Okay. Young athlete, what's your best advice, young athletes, for engagement and how do they try to navigate this, these troubled, challenging times? How young are we? I mean, well, let's I, just go like, high school. I mean, uh, anybody, we'll, we'll say non-elite level, younger, so high I school, college. I think it's really important for, the most important thing is just to have the conversations. So, be, I mean, far and away. I have learned over this last year and a half that when we stifle our voices, we don't get to hear whether or not the words we speak, if they make sense. We don't get pushed back. We don't get challenged. And if we stop putting our thoughts to words, we stop being able to think. We stop being able to process and grow. And so... The most important thing, no matter what side or what position you want to take on any issue, but particularly on this issue, and especially with young women, is to talk. Even if it's uncomfortable, even if it feels like you're just getting little bits at a time, encourage dialogue. We have to encourage people to speak again. We have to encourage people to not be afraid of their words. We have to encourage people to seek truth no matter how painful or difficult it is. So, I mean, my biggest advice is just talk. Talk to everyone, have the conversations. The more people speak, the more we're gonna get to the right solutions. And I think that goes for, I mean, any sports policy, for government, for families, for relationships. Just open dialogue is the solution. Marcia, so many uh, young women are afraid to speak up. And when they're active athletes and they're in a situation where they know the policies are not favoring them, they're even um, more hesitant. And, and what is the message that we, that we should give to them when they're in such a vulnerable position? Okay, I'm gonna call you out, Bonnie, for a second. Um, Bonnie is here today. She was one of the initial U of A signers on the letter that we submitted to the NCAA. Um, she, what, what year did you graduate? 2016. 2016. So she's of a different generation than me. But when we were passing out the letter to sign, she immediately added her name. And I would say that, you know, to, t to seize the opportunities that are in front of you. Sometimes you're gonna be the leader, sometimes they're gonna come across your desk. And there were a few that hesitated, that were not willing for various reasons, but um, there were so many, like Bonnie, that were willing to immediately sign their name to something. And so I would just say, seize the opportunities you have, now she's sitting in the audience here. She's you know, continually engaged, learning more, talking to her friends. So again, I think take the first step, step seize an opportunity, and talk to those around you. I want to jump in on the end of that. Yeah, you inspired me. Thank you for being here, Bonnie. <laughs> so the other thing I want to do is I don't think anyone has to feel pressure here either. We're all on our own independent journeys, and we all have things that we need to prioritize in our life. Someone very wise recently told me, who's a very close friend of, of Nancy's, um, this has to be a relay. This is not an individual event. So pass the torch, do what you can in your sphere of influence, take the breaks when you need to, and pass the baton to another person. And I think that's a very apt analogy for those of us fighting in the sports world in particular, right? Um, you don't, we all are on a life cycle journey of learning this, how we can speak, where our confidence levels are, how comfortable we are doing different things, but we all have gifts. So use your gifts. And like Marcy said, seize your opportunities. When something comes along, you're like, this is something I can do, do it. But don't put yourself in a position that's going to, ruin your life or your important relationship. Like, be conscious of yourself. 
give yourself time, give yourself grace. This is hard. It's hard to, it's really hard to internalize the abuse and discrimination that women are facing right now in the world. So give yourself time. Be, be good to yourself. All right, I'm going to ask Kim and Marshy one more question, which is related uh, to the last one. And then we'd like to open it up and get some comments uh, from you all. And, and some, there may be some fantastic ideas. I'm sure there are in the audience as well. So in terms of professional and adult athletes, so we were, the first question was on the younger athlete. Would any of your thoughts or advice be different in terms of the woman athlete who is a professional athlete and in an uncomfortable, situ a discriminatory situation? Well, this is why we exist. There wasn't anywhere for women to turn. So if you know someone who is struggling or if you see someone who is struggling, like we will be their voice. They don't have to do this by themselves. I was appalled when the Leah Thomas situation was facing women in the NCAA. And there was no organization, there was no established place for women to go that would have their backs. I mean, I, like I, I tried turning to the ACLU and the National Women's Law Center. I'm forever eternally grateful to have found Nancy Hogshead and Donna De Verona and Doreen Denny and Concerned Women for America and Independent Women's Forum and the, the I mean, who am I, and Wolf and Kara Dansky. I mean, just these people that were willing to say, you're not crazy, <laughs> we are with you. And then for us to say, okay, there needs to be a place, an organization that is specifically dedicated to women's sports that can be a network of female athletes to help ensure that women have a place to turn. And we're not going anywhere. We're just getting started here, folks. This is the beginning. So, yeah. <laughs> We are not going to abandon our female athletes on the playing field or off. So um, this, if, they're, if someone's needing support, like this is why we're here. And there's a responsibility of parents. Parents need to stand up for their athletes. Athletes need to have a place to turn. That's the end of it. Marshy. Uh, I'm not sure I could have said it better myself. <laughs> I'd, li I'd like to hear more from you all in the audience. Yes. So. <laughs> Can we pass some? Um, um, so one thing I'm saying, and I loved your announcement about the, the relay. Wait, can we do this? Those of you who don't know, for the license, oh, mainly for license. Some of the historical um, background. You know, we had Save Women's Sports, Beth Stelzer, and God bless her. You know, she, um, yeah, she was, uh, when we were starting about four or five years ago, she was in and started the organization. And for different reasons, many of them personal had to, had to peel off. And of course, she folded in with Linda Blade and the uh, International Consortium on, on, on Female Athletes or Women's Sports. There it is. But you know, she got actually um, targeted by the, um, the activists in powerlifting to try to literally destroy her life. And so I just want you to, I'm, I'm here in, in one sense just to say thank you to Beth because um, she was an inspiration for so many of us and seeing her emerge to tell her own story of, of what she faced in discrimination in 2018 and when that first launched and really became the foundation for this. And so what was so, such a thrill for us is when Marcia and Kim, uh, as Concerned Women for America, trying to work into this space and support the athletes, we were down in, in Georgia as well um, and protesting, organized the protest with Beth. Um, and to have an organization that Icons just came up to sweep up behind all of that and to take this, you know, the next level. And so, um, you know, just the idea that we all have to be in this together and that um, the, the voices that we can support, there's so many cases in the United States of young women on teams that have stood up for themselves, Peyton being among them, and she didn't want to get hurt. We've had Blake Allen in, in Vermont, and you know, they, they've had, they faced retaliation, they faced suspensions, but having the organizations like we, ha we've been able to be, to come up and support them, Kylie Lons and you know Riley and everyone else, of course, they jumped out and, and sort of did things on their own too. But um, just to say that there's never a time when we should walk it alone, right? And so 100%. it's so important that every opportunity we see with which is 
if we're connected to a sport in a community, in a context, to be able to come alongside and to be the kind of voice that's that's advocating and being support. That's what's going to make this work and, and is where we can be most effective. And tactically, we become much stronger and much more effective because it, that's what's been behind it. We know that the trolls are out there on Twitter, that anytime somebody says something, they're going to come in and try to pile on, do whatever it can to try to make them sound like there's a zillion people out there watching their every move to silence you. That's not necessarily true, but it's not necessarily false. And so um, I think that's the one thing we can help each other have some awareness about as well. Thank you. All right. Uh, yes, Mara. Hi. Do you have any tips on tackling female athletes who are on the other side? So to give you an example. <laughs> do you? <laughs> so I... I'm on a WhatsApp group with the women in my running club. So I'm long retired. I'm now a recreational runner. And one of them, who's an older master's athlete, very good, asked me what the latest on the trans thing was because she knows I follow it. This was in March when the World Masters Athletics was going on in Poland. And so I replied saying, Petrillo, the Italian sprinter, is entered in the 60, the 200, the 400. And I used the word male. And a young athlete, a female runner who's competitive, half my age, told me off on this WhatsApp group for using the word male, about a male. <laughs> and I, I, was, I just didn't know what to do. And I, I just thought, I can't be bothered with, you know... <laughs> it's okay. <laughs> I, I, I think the important thing is it's okay to let some people go. It's yeah. okay. Yeah. We don't, like... <laughs> We're not, not, you're never gonna, we're never gonna convince every soul in the world that, I mean, my gosh, you're not even gonna convince every soul in the world that women shouldn't be raped. You know, I mean, as preposterous of, as a statement that, you're not gonna convince everyone in the world that women deserve fair treatment. You're not gonna convince every, every person in the world that women deserve equal rights. So it, it's okay to let some people go. I'll just make one comment because they say that and, it, and the immediate reaction, uh, at least I've had and I suspect you've had, is to get defensive, right? They're attacking you because you didn't use the language that they wanted you to use, so you're being disrespectful or hateful. And so I have come up with, through coaching from my coach right next door to me, right, um, the language of science is never disrespectful. It is clear and unambiguous. Okay, and once I say that, I have regained my position. <laughs> the language of science, go ahead, Mary. The language of science is never disrespectful. It is clear and unambiguous. It is never disrespectful. So now you've just wiped out their whole position, right? where they're trying to attack you, and you're saying, now I'm using the language of science. So I have personally gotten better with having these little like nuggets in my back pocket that I can pull out now when I need them and I'm ready, instead of being like, <gasps> why don't they understand but, why I use the terms male and female? But don't we all know that in order to get to those nuggets, you have to have a few uncomfortable moments. Yes, so you, okay. we do, we do. Uh, who's got the microphone? Okay. Hi. I'm Maureen Monty, and I'm so excited to be here. I wanted to address the... Uh, could you speak into the mic a little bit more? Is that better? Yeah. Much better. Thank, Thank you. you. I wanted to address the speaking to the young athletes. And earlier today on the panel, they spoke about the leading upward to the CEOs. So I work at the level of the athlete, a high school athlete, Olympic athlete, some middle school. And... I have data that I won't go into, but female confidence level is very low. Not their competence, but their confidence. And so my job is to help them improve their confidence, but when they want to do something to speak, uh, and they don't know how, then they're afraid, right? So the first question, these are three things I do, and I invite you to consider it. One, I ask them, what does success look like? So whatever it is, what does success look like? So one, one young lady wanted to decline an offer from a college, but was, ups was worried about upsetting the coach, who'd been really nice. Good, good problem, right? So what does success look like? Saying thank you without hurting their feelings. Okay, cool. 
will write the script. I help them write the script. And then I make them practice. I'm the, the coach. You have to now read the, do the script with me. So one, what does success look like? Two, help them write the script. And three, make them practice. And then they've got the, the guts to go, to go for it, right? Now, that may take some doing. But, and I don't like write the script verbatim, but, but I help them so that they know I believe in them, then they can believe in themselves, and then they can go do it. So that's how you help on any of the topics, including the men in the locker room. So that's my take on that. Thank you. Okay, so we have... Yes, Cynthia. Yeah, um, one of the ways that I came out uh, slowly, obviously Julie was part of that, but um, uh, Glinner, um, Graham Glinnerham, uh, once upon a time had a coming out day once a year. And I did little things, you know, like I was on Over It, which is a female-centered um, social media site. And um, I actually said my name and what my, the city that I was in. And I took little baby steps. And so, you know, I'm, I'm con I, I like the idea of celebrating coming out, encouraging women and girls to come out, and celebrating those women that came out the past year, honoring them and their bravery. So that's my input on, on uh, coming out and learning to speak and reduce the costs of coming out. I like that. I like that a lot because I think one thing I told myself when I was just in the darkest place thinking that the world has abandoned me and my daughter, um, I said, I'm going to do two things today. I'm going to make one phone, I'm going to have one conversation, I'm going to write one letter. And I would just wake up each day and I would sit those two steps. And every time we take a step and every time we do the next thing, we get stronger and we get better. Yes. Um, so oh, I, yeah. <laughs> Hello. I see Yolanda. Um, I'm with the Rocky Mountain Women's Network. Um, so next month, or, well, this weekend, the ACLU has come up quite a few times. And next month on August 11th at 10 a.m., we will be at the Capitol Building in Washington, D.C. you hold DC. the microphone closer up to your mouth? Yeah. We will be in Washington, D.C. at the nation's Capitol Building, Area 10, protest protesting the ACLU. That is going to be at 10 a.m. on August 11th. Um, please join us. If you have any questions, please find me. I have some flyers to hand out for anyone who would like to join us. But we need as many people there. The lead organizers, amazing people. They have done a great Closer job. Closer to your mouth. They have done a great job making sure that we are going to be safe there. The police will be there with us. It's going to be a great time. Let's stop the ACLU. OK, I want you to repeat the date. I want you to repeat the location. And I want you to tell people, or I will tell people, you don't have to fly there, but if you know people that live nearby and can drive, think about who you know. Go ahead. So it will be on August 11th at 10 AM at our nation's Capitol building, uh, Area 10. Is there a website? I have it on the flyer. <laughs> OK, the flyer is uh, on the desk outside? It's in my purse. OK, <laughs> see her. <laughs> Okay, we have, a, we have time for a couple more uh, comments. Yes. Um, hi, thank Love you. Love your sweatshirt. Yeah. Oh, thank you. <laughs> um, so I got involved in this about a year ago um, through the medical side of um, gender ideology. And um, at my high school in California, where my kids are, there's over 100 kids identifying as transgender. And I did not realize until I got connected with ICONS, we have several um, male athletes, boys who are competing as girls and setting high school records at our high school, um, you know, for our, our individual high school and winning state championships. And it's all under the radar and I had no idea of the impact. Um, and I want to call it radical gender ideology. And this is the CIF, which is the California Inter Interscholastic Federation's Gender Diverse Youth Sport Inclusivity um, Toolkit. So this is given out to 320,000 girls in um, California. It's uh, 1,600 high schools. And every coach of every one of those girls' teams is told to talk to their girl athletes and make sure that they are um, inclusive and that they've been trained to understand um, how to respect the pronouns, how to make sure their locker rooms and bathrooms are um, you know, they're included in it. 
And um, it's very specific on how the coach is supposed to talk to the, to the team captains and how he's supposed to make sure the message gets um, so the whole team knows how to be inclusive. And I think I learned this weekend, this is um, psychological manipulation. And yeah, it is. Yeah, and, and, and what it's telling these girls is they have no voice. And not only that, they, have, they can't even think for themselves. They're, it's telling them how to think and how to talk. And um, I'm planning on um, really pushing back on CIF. And Julie is an inspiration because she's one of the people that's making this hit um, national, international headlines, what's happening with girls sports in California. And I think the CIF um, Federation, they don't, you know, they, they, they have a public comment process at every single executive committee meeting, but nobody shows up. Nobody realizes there's a public comment process. So we can show up at those meetings and start speaking out for those girls who have been silenced by their coaches. Yeah. Yeah. Pamela, do you have a microphone? Yeah. Yeah. You, yes, oh. please. Pamela, yeah. we'll come to you next. Go okay. Ahead. Yeah. Lorraine Muller, I think yes, Lorraine. most of you know me. Um, so this has been really, like, very significant for me. So I want to thank you very much for making me a part of it. Um, and uh, it's really, like, sunk in how important this is. How, like, I've, I've, I realize, like, you know... Um, we're like at the 23-mile mark of the marathon, right? You're almost there, but the further you get out, the harder it gets. And then you've really got to hang in. Um, so when I realise, like New Zealand, and you can see how locked in they are already, so they're way, way, way down the road. It's very, very scary for, you know, the country that I came from that I thought was, you know, it was free and beautiful and green and, you know, uh, women were the first ones to get the vote and all this kind of stuff, yeah. Um, what's happened there, you can see that that's where they want to go with here. So they're trying so hard. There is, a, it seems to me, an agenda that is very, very organised that's overriding. And for us to believe that there is a group of people, whoever they are, I don't know who they are, um, that don't have our best interests at heart. They have a, a different agenda that, um, that is driving it in a certain direction. And it's very organised and it seems to me well-funded. And they've got to jump on everybody. Um, what we have is we have our humanity. We are, we all, we care for each other. We're human beings, you know. We, um, we have to include our men. We have to bring, get more men included. I'd love to see at least, you know, half of them being, but thank you for you guys for getting involved and giving your voice because that's really important. Um, because what I see is these kids that are targeted. And if they take the woman down, then who's looking after the kids? And we're going to have a whole generation that is brought into these ideas, they've been indoctrinated in something that is false. And so our voices are so important. Um, what's going to happen when they are um, in 10 years' time, when they can vote? or they, um, they're going to be recruited to perpetuate this ideology, and we have to break that. We have to break it right now, or, um, you know, it's, we're sunk. But I, but I do think, you know, we strengthen numbers, and I really believe that, you know, um, the truth always prevails. It will so. eventually. Yeah. My yeah. issue is just is we're going to see how many women and girls get hurt along the path. I want to give Pamela a chance. She's had her arm up for forever. But thank you, Lorraine. And I think this will be, unfortunately, our last, our last one because I have a comment. I have a question to close for Kim and Marshy. Okay. We've got conflict. I just wanted to address... 
the idea of how we talk to people about this. And I think that there are a couple things to say. One is that there are two different kinds of conversations. One is the kind of conversation you have for the purpose of the person that you're talking to. And the other is the kind of conversation you have for the purpose of the audience that's watching who you're, you know, the conversation that you're having. And for the person who was talking about that WhatsApp group, when you're in some kind of a social, you know, a WhatsApp group or a, a chat or whatever, and somebody throws a bomb, the audience is who you're responding to, mm. not that person, right? So, but it's all, it, regardless of who you're talking to, be kind. You know, and like what Kim and, and um, Marcia and, and Mary were saying, you know, using accurate language is not unkind, it's unambiguous. And um, so you can say this, uh, that phrase is perfect. Um, and, um, and just to, to say what you need to say in the nicest way possible and to stand your ground and treat people like they are human beings, as you all do. And I think that really always works very well. Obviously, there are, there are cases where you get attacked physically, which is a different thing. This is the other last thing I wanted to say. Is there are two different kinds of bullying, right? There's the physical kind of bullying, and then there's the mean girl bullying. And I'm saying that in quotation marks, but we all know what that means. And that's what cancel culture is. It's mean girl bullying writ large. It's the same structure. It's a structure of reputation destruction and trying to interfere with your relationships and trying to interfere with people wanting to be close to you. Um, and so when you see it happen, defend. And when it happens to you, um, know that this is not, uh, uh, it's, it's not as bad as it seems. And you have all of the people here on your side that you can rely on. Right. And right. I wanted to just thank all of you for putting this together. This is just an amazing, amazing well, group. This is the two ringleaders. Sharon, we'll li I'd like you to make that last comment. Yeah. It's just a really important one um, to, to realize going forward. Obviously, right now, we've got all the federations, swimming, tra you know, track and field, uh, cycling, hopefully more to come. If they set rules that protect the female class and we have the Olympic Games in L.A., what are we going to do? You won't be able to hold them in LA. What? What, Anne? Uh, quickly, yes. So first of all, thank you very much for putting this on and thank you everyone for coming. We're talking about what we can do to maintain this, to keep it growing and to move it forward. And activism is right at the top but funding our organizations is also important. So I would like to ask each of you and to go out and talk to your friends, organizations that you belong to, to donate to Icons, Champion Women, Wolf, any of the organizations that are here today. Please be as generous as you can, because this is not free, what we're doing. I'm actually going to add on to that. I withdrew all of the donations I had established to any organization, any existing organization that didn't outwardly and openly defend the rights, sex-based rights of women. And I think, and I told them exactly why. I would encourage any of you to tell other people you know with funds, with means, who support organizations. I withdrew from my alma mater. I withdrew from the schools that my children are attending. I withdrew from their local high schools. I will not fund anything that does not rec recognize women as a sex class. <laughs> All right. We're coming up to a close of, I know, it's been an amazing, amazing meeting. So. Icons and the future. Marshy, what do you want to share with us? Um, part, part of it is, I think um, a couple speakers had mentioned this, you know, I hope we don't have to talk about this next year because everything is resolved. <laughs> Unfortunately, I think it's going to take a little bit longer than that. Um, so I would just um, encourage we need to grow in numbers, we need to grow in funds, we need to grow exponentially so that our voices overtake anyone in opposition to us. And so um, just encourage you to go out now that you've, 
I mean, I don't know about you, but I have learned so much over the course of this weekend that I'm going to take forward. So bring it forward, um, and let's just continue to grow. Kim Jones, closing comment. I mean, just go do the work, folks. <laughs> We're going to plow on. We are going to be laying out our, our plan for the next year. And um, I can't believe, looking back, how far we've come in a year. And I hope that in a year from now, we're even more blown away by where we are. But that is entirely dependent upon everyone who hears these messages going out and doing their part. So thank you for being here. Thank you for making the insane travel arrangements that so many of you did and for committing a beautiful summer weekend to um, talking about the rights of women and girls. So let's give a final thanks to Kim and Marshy. Before we go, I want to thank Janice in the back, oh, Suzanne, yes. all of these amazing people in the back who have been helping us all weekend, the hotel, photographers, social media people who um, need a lot of credit for helping us put this on. And, and for I those think who last couldn't be here today. As last well. but not least, we've got to give a special thanks to Riley Gaines, who has... <laughs> Leading the charge and reaching more people than we, you know, I mean, we're just blown away by your efforts. Woman of Steel back there. Thank you. Woo!